We have a quorum and the committee is now in public session. We are joined by the controller and auditor, Sir General Seamus McCarthy, as a permanent witness to the committee, and he is joined by Kieran Wright, senior auditor. Apologies have been received for today's meeting from Deputy Shane Cassells and Deputy Pat Deering. Um, the minutes of the meeting, we did not approve the minutes of the meeting of the 8th of November last week as there was one slight wording change to be made. Um, are the minutes for that meeting now agreed? Agreed. And are the minutes for the 29th of November and the 6th of December agreed? Is that agreed? Agreed. And um, next item then is matters arising out of the ministers. I don't think there's anything specific because the correspondence will cover most items. So the first item of correspondence is category A, briefing documents and opening statements. Um, item number 1788 and 1791 from Shauna Falou, Secretary General of the Department of Education and Skills, dated the 6th of December and the 11th of December, providing briefing note and opening statement for today's meeting on the provision of school transport. We note and publish this. That's agreed. Next item, 1790, the opening statement for Bus Aaron. We note and publish that. That's agreed. Agreed. Next item, correspondence from accounting officers and our ministers and follow-up to PAC meeting and other items for publication. We held three items over from last week's meeting just for further review. And the first item was from um, Mary Lawler, uh, Public Affairs Manager, NAMA, dated 29th of November, providing further information requested by the committee in relation to pro Project NANS and a breakdown of the 24 billion in asset sales categorised by jurisdiction and purchaser. Um, the situ so we... Um, We've, we note and publish this, but we're going to, um, we have requested a note from the Parliamentary Legal Advisor in relation to the Section 172. We, do, we won't be dealing with that today, so we'll be dealing with it as soon as possible. So we'll note and publish that, and we'll consider that letter from them as part of um, that briefing we're going to get from the Parliamentary Legal Advisor. Next item is 1767B from the Clerk. To the Committee of Procedure dated 30 November forwarding a complaint in relation to matters raised by the Committee in advance of the recent presidential election. The complainant believes the Committee raised a matter of presidential expenses so it would become an issue in the election campaign. And we agreed to note and publish a redacted form of the correspondence last week not to identify the person involved. However, we propose to draft a letter um, to the Committee on Procedure and a similar letter to the individual who raised the matter, stating that the Committee's consideration of the CNAG's appropriate appropriation accounts 2016 vote number one President's establishment was within the remit of the Committee, and the Committee's work highlighted um, important issues regarding transparency in relation to the funding of the Office of President. Is that agreed? And will you? Yeah. Just to yeah. just kind of go sideways on it, I mean, part of our problem was that it wasn't looked at until very very um, near to the election. Mm. Now, um, we need to be considering how we actually knit that into our work yeah. programme, you know, whenever is the appropriate time. Uh, okay, so Deputy, know. on that, what, what, I, what I'm suggesting to the committee is that um, the President's establishment, the vote, um, is done as part of the group of votes for the Department of Antioch at the, at the Estimates Committee. Right. So we will take it as part of uh, the day we have the Department of Antioch in dealing with their votes. And there's a number of votes associated with the Department of Antioch. You know, the Attorney General, the Chief State Solicitor Office, and the CS Central Statistics Office, something like that. So there's quite a bit under the group of votes under the Department of Antioch. And this is an associated vote that is always taken as part of that group in the estimates debate. So we will group it as part of the meeting we'll be having uh, with the Department of Antigua because they discuss it at estimates time. And I think I have that proposed for the work program to do that group somewhere early Fine. in the new year. Deputy Cullinan. Yeah, um, I don't agree with the premise of the, the letter, obviously, and I support replying back to it, responding back to it. Um, which is two things. There was an audit committee established as well, wasn't there, within the Oris? Was not part of the changes that were made? So, Correct, yes. Yeah, I th and I think in future when we're dealing with it, obviously we can deal and put questions to them as well. Um, because that, is that, is that, has that met yet? It hadn't met, I think, when the accounting officer was in. Was that the case? No, my recollection is that they had met. All right, okay. Yeah. No, I think there, there was a problem going back a number of years. That's right, yes, um, I had met. So since, for yeah. 2016, there hadn't been a meeting. Yeah. But during 2018, certainly, 
um, there, there have been meetings. Okay. Um, there was an issue with one of the expenses that was an undoubted one, um, yeah. and that there was, uh, you know, the commentary on it, uh, I think the President himself said that once the election was over, he had no difficulty in publishing details of that. Okay. So, and, and I understand there has been um, uh, an announcement that they will be publishing something soon, soon in yeah. relation okay. to so that. That's all progress. Just on that, just to, so for the benefit of people watching, <clears throat> we dealt with the vote number one, which was voted expenditure by the Oireachtas and the accounting officer for the Department of the Teachers, the accounting officer. And that's who we had before in on this topic, and that's who we will have again. And when we're dealing with the votes for the Department of Intention, and we'll include that as a specific item. However, what the Deputy has said is it's important to clarify that um, allowance was, is paid directly from the central fund, which doesn't go through voted expenditure at all. And that was one of the issues. And the central fund is managed by the Department of Finance. So we will specifically have to deal with that amount with the Secretary General of the Department of Finance when they're in because that's known as the Central Fund, the Finance Accounts of the State, which don't go through the Oireachtas for a vote, may not the right from being interest on the national debt and contributions to the EU and payments for judges and different things like that that are not voted through the Oireachtas, including that allowance that we spoke about. And that allowance, by the way, wasn't, can't be audited by, I don't even think the audit team or by, the, by, by anybody, it's not the issue. That, the that spending of it is not subject to audit by me. Yeah. The payment is, but the, the payment, payment is, but the spending payment is. And what, what we did say, just maybe to be, what we said was when we finished our discussion and we we're heading into the campaign that we wouldn't discuss the president's establishment any further until we come to do it formally in the new year. Mm. And everything you're saying will be dealt with. Perfect. And we will formally do it. And rather than us preempting our discussion that we're going to have this yeah. spring, I'm just saying. It will have to involve the two separate Secretary Generals to deal with the full aspect of the expenditure in our and um, Tisha's office and finance. Yeah, um, okay. Just, uh, we, I mean, that goes way back. That goes back to the 90s. Mm -hmm. um, and it would be quite useful for us when they come in to give us some sort of a, an understanding of why it was decided to do it that way. Because just as that is an anomaly, there may well be other anomalies, and it would be quite interesting to see how those kind of anomalies uh, originate. Uh, Deputy, it actually goes back to 1938 with the establishment of the Office of President. Right. Okay. Uh, but it was were, escalated, I think, at, in yeah, the mid it, It's it? increased very significantly yeah, in yeah, 1997, you know, I yeah. think. Okay. Okay. We'll certainly come to that, and we'll get the briefing in the background. I'm guessing, and I use the word guessing, it was done so there wouldn't be a controversial debate in the floor of the doll about um, that type of expenditure um, in an estimates process. But I think, you know, what was valid in 1938 may not be valid, you know, in 2018. So that's a matter we will discuss when we come to it, you know, and we'll look at that finance account specifically because there's, it's always a concern to me that there's big items are specifically paid through this account and never discussed in the floor at all in terms of, you know, you've heard me take, saying this before, so we'll pay, pay special attention to that account this year when finance... We'll recall as well that there's quite significant net allied services, yeah. uh, Office of Public Works and Department of Foreign Affairs. So I, I, I think it, you may need to plan a little bit around how best to interrogate the, expendi the, the total, total expenditure for the service. Question rather than interrogate. Yes. But that's the auditor speaking for you now, you see. We're, we're, polite, that we're polite politicians. Now you know why the fear auditors. Okay? Right. So, um, yeah, exactly. So, can we agree to write to the person on the basis that that it was within our remit? And we're not getting into any of the politics. We're just taking it back. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's right. Next item then, uh, measure 1768, Kieran Green, Director of the State Games Agency, dated 30 of November, providing further information requested by the Committee regarding medical negligence, open disclosure, cervical check, thalidomide related litigation. And um, we held this over from the last day. And I, I, what I will say about the car, that particular item correspondent, the very useful information in this that's going to feed into our per periodic report. We asked for a breakdown. Um, um, in relation to various aspects of the claims. They don't want to identify hospitals and, you know, they talk about groups of hospitals and we don't want to 
you know, go there at this point in time. We can consider the matter next year. However, there's two items that do give a breakdown in relation to the number of claims for maternity services and then the total number of claims. And one issue I had asked was, out of what they pay every year, approximately how much goes to the wards of court? And they've given the figure. Um, in 2015, it was 101 million. In 2016, it was 81 million. In 2017, it was 126 million. And to date this year, it's been 87 million up to the 31st of October. And that is an issue that I know the Justice Committee has done a report on the wards of court. And I think there will be a debate on the doll in the new year on that report. Um, but this is very interesting information which we've never seen before. And there appears to be a practice that most of the serious cases it's agreed in the courts that person be deemed a ward of court. So it looks as if a very high percentage of the payments made by the State Claims Agency um, are actually paid to the wards of court fund. And it does be, lead to another question because the ward of court fund are out of the reach of public scrutiny, whereas when it's in the State Claims Agency, it's within public scrutiny, it goes out of public scrutiny and it's beginning to come back at us again. So I, I think actually we'll just ask for one other bit of information in relation to that chart to give us the total of other payments for compensation, you know, give, uh, and so we can see the percentage of their total payments that go to the wards of court. I found, I was surprised, that I, just, I just asked a question just out of guesswork and I'm stunned that the the amount of money that's going directly to the Wards of Court, and it probably shows you how big an issue that Wards of Court issue is, actually. That, that's the scale of figure. So, so we just want the total, the total payments uh, based on what's in Table 3 um, for the total payments, and then we'll be able to get the percentages of the total payments that are paid in respect of Wards of Court. Yeah, okay. just in relation to the State Claims Agency, I just, I've said it before, I think there was a couple of things conflated when they were in, and I, I do think it, it's one that we're definitely going to have to have a have to have a really another really good look at because the whole issue of open disclosure. My understanding is that the state claims agency have a function in um, in um, if you like supervising or assisting some. Uh, parts of the public service in mitigate, mitigating against um, or advi an advisory role or something in, in relation to mitigating against claims arising in the future. Um, and um, a, would, a risk, uh, risk yeah, management yeah. Um, uh, advisory function. Yeah. It would be quite useful to have that as part of the look that we take at them, like for example the, the like of the Air Corps would fall in there as, 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 as an area that we should look at when, we're, when we have the State Claims Agency in again, uh, because they would have done some supervising there, and I think that there are, there's, issues, there's issues there that definitely require uh, some, uh, some scrutiny. Um, and in relation to open disclosure in the non, what do they call it, non-clinical non non cl claims as well, um, that, that we actually look at a range, including cervical check, including the like of the, um, in, including the, the wards, including the, um, the, the like of the difference in relation to, say, the, the types of hospitals that claims arise, but also that other component, that other component I think is important as well, because if we're going to prevent claims in the future, we have to look at how they do their work in relation to that, that risk assessment as well. Because I think it, 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 it's, if that fails, then we're going to end up with, uh, we're going to end up with, um, uh, with claims that we shouldn't have. So that is absolutely correct. And we've had some engagement with the State Claims Agency, but I think we can see there's quite a bit of work to be done in this area that has never been done before here in the Oireachtas in relation to the costs of all these claims and prevention, minimising and what's being done and what lessons are being learned, you know. And I think we have a bit of work to do on that. You know, I'm not saying we'll do a special report on this issue. We might, but yeah. certainly it'll be very significant in our, you know, our report, uh, reports at some stage during 2019, now that we're all here. I found that, Chair, and I've raised it just tangential to that, and it's part of it. There, the, when something happens in a hospital, and inevitably that's human, 
and then there's an internal review and an external review. And I've, th th arising from th those instances, very often there are claims. But there's no record of those reviews. And I've raised this at the last meeting. For example, the Salta Group in Galway have no record. They've answered back in a question. We have no record of the reviews held and the cost. These are external reviews now. I'm not asking about internal reviews. We have, that's, the, that's the official answer. We have no record uh, of the external reviews carried out in the last 10 years or the cost. You mean in the hospital? Yeah. yeah. Uh, an external review yeah. of something that happened. We'd say uh, Savita Halad Panadar, yeah. for instance, and this is the most obvious one. My, my understanding was that their point was that they don't have a central record of is that it. it? So, so that they can't easily tell you what the aggregate of all those is, or the aggregate cost of them is. But obviously for any individual one, if they check the files relating to the incident, there would be evidence there. I, I, I would be... Well, one would presume that. You would presume... Yeah. I, I'm, I am yeah. presuming it, yeah. but uh, it's certainly yeah. something... Well, no, it's just, it's just... It ties into it, because if you look at the reviews, and then we need to know the cost of them, and we need to know what arose out of them prior to any cases, and what has been learned. But if there's no record... Now, the answer I got back, I'm, I'm really struggling with where to go with it, but it was clear that there were... We have no record. It was a simple question. Yeah, How I'm, many reviews and the cost? External reviews. Yeah, I, I mean, one of the um, core elements of of um, a governance structure is a risk management uh, capacity in an organization and what a risk management capacity should be doing is identifying those types of issues identifying the learning points and ensuring that there is follow-up and uh, that any continuing exposure is dealt with uh, so if you like there should be some kind of oversight of what have where have things gone wrong and have we learned the lessons and have we implemented the changes in an organisation? And I think maybe that, that's the place to, to kind of to focus on um, in addressing uh, SAILTA. Well, if you don't have that, yes. what is your risk management um, function doing if it's not doing that? Okay. okay and Thanks, right. Thank you. The State Claims Agency said to give a report back to the hospital, but your hospital managers come and go and it's not a central learning process to, to give a report back to the hospital. So sometimes the State Claims Agency reports to the hospital. These reports you've just mentioned are commissioned centrally some, on some occasions and they don't go to the hospital and um, there is a gap. I don't even know that, Chair, but a simple question. How many external reviews have been carried out in the last 10 years? How many and the cost of them and who were they carried out by? That information should be readily available and passed on in terms of openness and accountability and feeding into the State Claims Agency. They have to be aware of all of that as well. Otherwise, how can they do their job? Do you want us to write to the directly on that? Uh, well, I, uh, perhaps, to... perhaps I come back to you. I, I yeah, could do with some will. help on it, but perhaps I come back with the question and discuss it with you first. Yeah, okay. Thanks. And we will, we will come to And specifically on that, uh, tonight from a correspondence from a previous meeting, we had We'd asked for a breakdown of the cost of the review that was carried out in Port Leash Hospital, and we told them it cost 399,000, and they wrote back to us telling us it was 399,000 euro. And we have asked for a breakdown, so make sure we, we get that in due course. We formally asked for that quite a number of weeks ago. Um, next item of correspondence I just want to deal with is one that we dealt with last week and we just held over. It was reference number 1754. Um, you might. Um, it's from the Secretary General of the Department of Housing and Local Government and we discussed it briefly last week um, and that was the one where I mentioned where the credit policy of Rebuilding Ireland loan scheme was heavily redacted. But I just want to note and publish the document because I think Deputy Murphy said we were, it was so voluminous we said maybe we'd hold it over for consideration. But I want to formally put it out there at this stage. don't want to leave it hanging until the new year. We had a preliminary discussion on it last week. But just in the event that we didn't formally sign off on it, I uh, would just do that now. Can I just ask yeah. a related question? Yeah. Uh, the issue of bringing the uh, city and county CEOs. We'll talk on it in a work programme maybe in a few minutes. We have to make any progress, but a work programme is coming up in a minute. Okay. Okay? Grand. Okay, next item of correspondence then is... Um, 
1775 is from Des Fitzgerald, President of the University of Limerick, dated the 4th of December, providing additional information requested by the committee in relation to the steps taken by the university to engage with three specific members of our former members of staff. There are a number of employees or former employees of UL who have been in correspondence with the committee on this topic, and therefore I think it's appropriate to ask the President to confirm that those to whom the correspondence refers have also been sent a copy of the correspondence that we, re that we received, and if not to do so. We note the correspondence and will not uh, publish this specific item at this stage. Um, we will be dealing with the Limerick whistleblowers <coughs> in UL early in the new year, so we'll come back to this as part of our work. We'll just hold over the CNHE special report, or is that separate? It's separate. You know, the whistleblower is issued and we have the CNAG report. So that we'll come to the work programme literally in a few minutes, so we'll, we'll hold that over on the, until then. Um, but we want to write back to them to make sure the people involved have been notified of that issue. Um, next item then is... Um, do you want to get my items here? No, um, it was a three-page letter, but there's one item I want to confirm um, in the letter back to the, the his second last paragraph um, in the letter on page seven. He says, accordingly, person B and C remain employees of UL. UL continues to engage with persons B and C so as to ensure they can return to the workplace as soon as possible. I raised this the last day, and I think we might have written to him, and if we have, I want to know where in the workplace are they talking about. Is it the situation they're being offered some other job in some other section that is not, not the job that they were in before this incident? And I think we need clarification <coughs> of that. As on first reading of that, you would think they're back. But I think if you delve deeper, they mightn't be back in their own job. So I want that point to clarify. Yeah, so, so we want that clarified. Um, so that's that. Next item then is uh, 1765 from 1776 from Ray Mitchell, providing uh, the HSC providing information requested regarding the transfer of property on Grace Park from the religious congregations. We'll note and publish this, and we're to keep a hold of it. They're still uh, still between the solicitors, so we'll um, you know we won't sign off on that religious uh, the congregation handing over the sites yet, but that specific one in the HSC, it's an update on the letters that are toing and proing, but no conclusion. So we'll continue to monitor that, and we'll note and publish this. Next item then is 1778 from Secretary General of the Department of Education and Skills, providing information requested by the Committee and instruction to give to ETBs in respect to publication of their minutes of ETB meetings, including the date of commencement and the schedule for each of the ETBs for the publication of their minutes. Uh, I'm pleased today that all ETBs are now publishing their minutes um, of their agreed meetings online. We'll note and publish this, so that's something we have achieved to um, help get that carried out at local level. I think that's a good development. Um, yeah, that's a good away development. From the confirmation that they're now available. Pardon? On, they're now available, available online. online. They send us links. Yeah, and they've sent links into correspondence. So <coughs> if somebody calls up the correspondence on your electronic format, you'll be able to get straight links into each of the ETVs. And the, so that's useful. And we'll publish that so anybody who wants to access the PAC website will be able to follow that through. Next item of correspondence 1779 from Ray Mitchell, um, Health Executive. Health Service Executive dated 5th of December providing a detailed notice requested by the committee on the release of slides related to cervical check. Can we note and publish this? Can I just comment yeah. on this? Um, I suppose one of the first things you learn in politics is that you read something and then you decode it and then you read it again. Um, and, um, and it's very welcome to get this information. But um, I fast forward to further slide requests on page six. And, and when I read that, I mean, there are, there's going to be a case next week on the 20th, I think it is, um, where the, um, uh, there's going to be an application to the High Court um, to have the records of some of the, these women uh, released, the slides released. Um, now, why is that happening? Um, no, no, just let me just finish Sorry, yeah. um, uh, On reading this, uh, essentially, uh, it, would, it looks like there's a, you know, a, a fairly short time frame for, for, uh, for providing these slides. Now, I'm in 
talk and talk to some of the people involved. And some of the applications go back to April that were included in these 18. But a fresh application came in. It's, it's from the original date that we should be. It, it doesn't acknowledge anywhere there that, uh, that, the, that the original application for these slides goes back to last goes back to last April and May in some situations. What, but what it gives the impression that it is actually a shorter duration by virtue of the fact that there was a second application. Now, essentially the key issue here is, is the format that the slides are produced in, or the photographs, so as that they're usable in the event of there being a court case. Now, there was to be a meeting with the Minister for Health that was cancelled at very short notice, like 12 hours notice or something, to the huge disappointment of the 221 Plus group. And this, I think, would have been one of the issues that would have featured. I, where there's a lot of information here that is accurate, I think that there is a piece of information that I think certainly takes a liberty, and I think the, um, and a significant liberty. The failure here to begin with was that people were not given information about their own health. That has been repeated by virtue of the fact they're going to have to go to court to get, to get um, albeit a small number, are going to have to go to court to have the court determine whether or not these records can be released. I just don't think we were given any kind of a flavour of that when they came in here in terms of there being a dispute. And for me, <coughs> that is misleading this committee. Okay. Um, just, I, just for the record, and I understand everything that's said, and I've been speaking to some of the ladies directly involved you know, in recent times as well, but just for public information, I want to just hit on a few points in the letter, because it's a very extensive letter. With, very detailed information and we do welcome the information yes. provided and it's the first time anybody will have seen this level of information in relation to the science. But I do want to just make a few points for people watching it, right? Um, <clears throat> they're saying in relation to the cytology slides, <clears throat> they say it's a condition of the laboratory that they hold the document for up to um, 10 years once testing has been completed. Now then to go on on page two, and this is really the kernel of the issue that you've mentioned, that the HSC have put what they call a protocol in place because they say it's crucially, these slides are a critical piece of primary physical evidence that will be relied on by the patient to advance their claims and by the laboratories in the HSC in defending any such claims. And they put an exact protocol in place as to how they're to be released. And I'll just c come back to that because it's a re relevant um, and they want to maintain the chain of custody. The HSC wants to ensure that they're issued from laboratory to laboratory transfers. And uh, even though the HSC and the National Screening Service uh, is the legal custodian of these, um, they're actually regularly, fit, they're normally held in laboratories. Now, I, I move on to say, they do actually take a digital image of taken to record the condition of the slide prior to its dispatch so as to ensure that if a slide is lost or damaged in transit, a secondary record of the contents of that slide will be available. Now, typically, t taking of such images requires the input of a specialist cytologist or screener. So that, some of the reason for the delay, I'm, not, I'm just putting that on the record, I'm not agreeing or disagreeing. They're saying some of the issues the patients have um, there might be a single patient slide, um, and there might be in one or two, in some cases, there might be in one or two more laboratories. So maybe a, more than one laboratory has to be contacted for some individual patients. Um, then they go on to say that um, they contact, they're saying early on before they establish their protocol, um, people, because it is their medical information, were contacting the laboratories directly. And that was, so the HSE were losing a chain of custody, as they would call it, of evidence that might be very relevant. So they put this um, um, protocol in place, and, and that has ensured that the HSE now has a centralised approach. Um, I just want to, and pick me up now when I'm finished on this. So they have said that the updated position as of 
uh, Friday the 28th of November was slides have been released under the protocol to 30 patients represented by 16 different firms as solicitors and a number of patients receiving slides following direct contact with the laboratories before the protocol was put in place was 18 and then to go on over the page and give the release time of 49 and uh, uh, 49 slides that's not 49 people because some people might have slides in more than one laboratory and it's clear that 25% of them were well over the eight week period now um, then I move on then to say um, the protocol I just can't find it in the letter here but they have to, they have very clear in the protocol that when the arrangements are being put in place for the request for the slides to be transferred from laboratory to laboratory it must also be to an identified person with relevant experience taking overall responsibility for maintaining the physical environment in which the slides are stored and examined and I think we would have to agree with that yes right we would have to agree with that and I think in and then I'm, I'm moving on. The core case then is that, um, is, is, is that some people want their slides released but not in accordance with the HSE protocol. And I think the essence of the case is not that people can't get their slides. The HSE are saying slides should be issued according to this protocol. People are saying we want their slides not through the protocol. Outside. Now just correct me yeah. if I'm wrong is in there. And I think that's why the HSE are from a centralised basis want to maintain the chain of custody and say if slides are being transferred from laboratory to laboratory and to name physician to name physician um, they want it done in accordance with the protocol and they probably want to maintain the integrity of that protocol rather than it happening outside of that protocol. I'm almost finished now and, and pick me up on anything you want but this is such an important issue it's important to put this information out there and then they say the, the, the so they're saying a firm has indicated it wishes to have the high court rule on these arrangements and it should be um, that should be applied to the release of the slides where there are no legal proceedings in being now they might be in being now but they might be at a later date and then they go on to say that um, it should be noted for completeness that on the 8th of November the HSE had not received the information necessary to release the slides to 51 patients in question um, 18 patients who have issued proceedings and 33 who had not. And in what had happened in those cases, they had identified the laboratory in Northern Ireland. However, they had not given the name of the person who was going to be the responsible person in the laboratory. And the HSC actually said that they consider it likely that many of the requests that were recently referred to at our meeting are possibly part of that 51 that they haven't released because they haven't been given the name of the person who is going to take custody for it in the laboratory in Northern Ireland. And um, so, and then to give the turnaround time on the table of slides. All I'm doing is summarising their letter. That's all I've been doing. I'm not, and if it looks as if I'm defending, I'm summarising their position because I want to put. So, really, the essence seems to be there are a number of cases held up where the person in the laboratory hasn't been identified. And the HSE, we're not giving it to a laboratory unless we know who they are. And then there's other people who don't want to go through the HSE protocol. And that seems to be the essence of the court case. Now, now, Deputy I, Murphy, and that's just my reading right, of their okay. letter. And, and I agree with a lot of that. Um, and I, I certainly, the, nobody, including the women involved, would want the uh, original uh, slides to be, you know, exposed to any kind of damage or whatever. It, it's not in anyone's interest. Yeah. Um, so, so, quite rightly, there's a protocol. Um, the, my understanding is that uh, the protocol uh, was, uh, was, n was deemed not sufficient by one solicitor um, and who had experience in the courts in contesting a case. And, uh, and that same solicitor is, has a number of, case, uh, no, a number of clients um, and went back and suggested some amendments to the protocol within a week and that was in September. And that has, and has not been engaged with since. Um, and I think that's important to say that. Now, so essentially the HSC is saying it's our protocol, it can't be amended. Now, my understanding is that the difficulty is that the resolution that the, uh, the or the photograph of the slide is uh, that the HSC are proposing would be not sufficient to uh, it's not sufficient a resolution to to show uh, 
the, the abnormalities. Now, what use is that? And that, I think, is the kernel of the problem. Um, but it does, just going back to us relying on information, when a public body comes in here, we were told there was a 22-day turnaround. It was like as if we were inventing a problem. That problem has been acknowledged in this letter, and it will be further acknowledged next week. And I hope it doesn't go to court. I hope it doesn't have to go to court. Um, but there, there would be absolutely zero point in going to court if there was a satisfactory outcome to this. Um, and it strikes me that there, that there was zero discussion of there being a problem here um, when, when we had them in. Uh, and I, I really do take exception to that. We either believe people when they come in, they tell us, and the word candour has been used here uh, on numerous occasions, um, and we wouldn't have had to keep on going back looking for information if we had been in the first, if it had all been outlined in, in the first instance. But there continues to be a problem. Um, and, uh, and I think that that, that is something that I, I think the public... Uh, would be surprised at, given how um, the failure in the first place, or part of the failure in the first place, was not providing or not giving the information that uh, that was needed. And look, it has to be given in a format that's usable as well. Okay. Look at what the deputy is saying, and, and I do say, I think on a couple of occasions they acknowledged the unsatisfactory time was taking, and they do put their hands up. You know, and they're not disguising that. But in its own way, it's important that we release this letter today yeah. because a lot of people are looking for this. There's information. <coughs> and our discussion teasing out the issues here now are probably helpful to the process. And I would say to the HSE, please listen to what's been said here this morning because you know, we, we were told these things shouldn't have to go to court. And if it's issues in relation to the details of a protocol, try and sort that out without yeah. going to the High Court if at all possible. You know? That's, and I think we're, we'd be unanimous in that if that can be done. Okay, so Deputy, thanks now for raising it, and without you pursuing it the last day, we wouldn't have had that correspondence here today. So that's actually very useful, um, I think, for a lot of people involved, and especially uh, the women directly affected. So next item of correspondence is 1780 from um, our, the, the HSC, providing information in relation to the light report and the governance arrangement in the section 38 and 39 organisations. It's expected that we'll be given a copy of this report in January. Next item, 1782 from Pat Smith, Interim CEO of Tusla, dated the 4th of December, providing information um, requested by the committee on the procedures to secure service level agreement and the memorandum of understanding on information sharing with the Garda Síochána. So we'll note and publish that. The important aspects of this letter, to say, in relation to the memorandum of understanding uh, with sharing of information with the Garda uh, Shia Khanna, they obviously make quite an issue of the data sharing agreement and the legal services are involved from both organisations and I think um, um, they're getting advice on that and they say once approved and signed off, Tusla and the Garda Shia Khanna will agree an implementation strategy. The time frame for implementation has been set for quarter one, 2019. So that's useful. And then the other item is they give a full list of all the organisations that they have, um, uh, they, that they've commissioned um, a service level agreement with. And I think every one of their organisations, bar one, has signed the service level agreement. And that one is being in the process of, to use their words, um, they're being in the process of being decommissioned from dealing with TUSLA. So, um, progress again on following up those service level agreements, because we started with the HSE, we found the weakness in TUSLA, we referred to it in our periodic reports, and they seem to be 100% on top of the job. Now, okay, so we know it's been published now. Next item of correspondence is 1784 from Liam Sloan, Chief Executive of National Treatment Purchase Fund, dated 5th of December, providing information requested by the committee and the review of the pricing me mechanism for long-term residential care in private and voluntary nursing homes, and it includes a note on the progress of the light prospectus review, and it includes a note on the um, steering committee, um, the national treatment, the the the, um, the steering nursing committee, nursing, um, nursing home steering committee, and we'll note and publish that, and people may be interested in that. 
It's a follow on from the information we requested and is a copy of minutes of meetings and copy of records of information. So that, that's useful. <coughs> Next item then is 1785 from Niall Cody, Chairman of the Revenue Commissioners, uh, providing an information note on one, testing the constitutionality of excise law in the tax appeals case. That was mentioned at our meeting and he. He says it's not a matter for the Tax Appeals Commission to make any uh, determination. That's a matter for the courts to decide constitutionality. In relation to, he provides information on high income individuals' restoration. A summary of the section 485F carry forward of excess relief for the years 2007 to 2016. And that's as a result of a question I asked, and it's also good to get that in the public information. One of the reasons some of the high wealth individuals uh, pay uh, quite a reduced amount of tax, and we understood that if they had losses, if they had um, claimed this allowance, carry forward losses in a particular year, if they didn't use all their losses, they could carry them forward again. So he's given the restriction, um, the high income individuals restriction. Um, on that, and some people will be interested in that. He gives the, we ask for details of the fines imposed by court in respect of tobacco fines. We found the farcical for the millions involved, the amount of fines that was issued was farcical, and it's got more farcical now. I said that um, of the three cases that went to court, one person was fined twelve thousand euro and two individuals each received a fine of five thousand euro and one individual received a fine of five thousand euro and they all got any of them that got a sentence all of them had it fully suspended so there is zero deterrent to smuggling in ireland as far as i can see zero and i think we talk about it every year and um if the revenue or somebody should be given authority to impose very serious fines all that happens is they lose that particular shipment and they carry on the next week with the next lorry load. So there's zero, and that's something we will have to come down firmly on in our periodic report. No wonder it's happening to that scale, because there's zero enforcement, of <coughs> zero penalties um, relative to the scale of activity. Um, next item then is 1786 from Ray Mitchell, Nat the HSE. Is that a criminal, is that a criminal um, offence? And I I'd expect criminal. My yeah. understanding would be that it, it is, is criminal. Yeah, it is prosecuted. Okay. Or potentially prosecuted. Okay. Yeah. And and would they be required to pay the costs as well? In a criminal case, yeah. I don't think that arises usually. Probably at legal aid, you know. I just because yeah, that's it, it's actually then a cost to go going to court. In actual state has to take yeah. the cost. Yeah. Actually, and I want to clarify what I said was I asked for the highest fines. And that covers 2016, 2017, 2018, this year, just three years. So it's farcical. farcical. So, so we in our report will point out that this matter needs to be taken seriously. Could we get an idea of the cost of prosecuting one of those yeah. as well? Yeah, we'll, we'll, ask the, we'll ask the revenue. Now, maybe the revenue, they, I don't know, is it, would they be the people taking the prosecution? To it? Possibly. I, I'm have, not sure it, it right could be. Over to the guard, or can they prosecute themselves? And a cost. We'll ask for that in relation to the cases, um, the, the legal costs, in relation to, you know, for each of the 2016, 17, and 2018 to date. So we'll ask for that. Yeah. Next item, then, as I said, is um, from Ray Mitchell, the HSE. We're keeping that man busy this week. Um, a note on the record retention policy in place, in particular procurement documents and changes that will be made to this, and a note of providing a list of supports available to those affected by the H1N1 vaccine. So that's the flu vaccine. And this arose out really about the procurement for goods and services and retention of records, because we did find that uh, in relation to cervical checks, some of the documentation wasn't maintained on file. So that's where that query arose from. Next item of correspondence, 1787, from Nish, Nick Ashmore. Chief Executive, Strategic Banking Corporation of Ireland, dated 5th of December 2018, providing a response requested by the committee regarding the value of her money query. I propose we forward a copy of the correspondence to the individual who raised the matter. Now, I find this response completely unsatisfactory because I think we asked some questions, I'm speaking from recollection, they have a major fund available. They don't lend directly, but they're, they're provided to, to their on, on um, th their term is they provided to their on lenders, on as in banks or other institutions. And we, I want to know 
the breakdown in relation to how much is provided through the banks and how much is provided through non-bank on lenders. And I find it extraordinary that we should write to the Strategic Banking Corporation of Ireland and get a three-page letter back in relation to money matters without a euro symbol in the letter. That's lovely long talk about policies, principles. He could have taken it out of the opening statement of his annual report of what to do. It gives us none of the information we're really looking for, which is how much they've lent on, how much the banks have lent on, how much the other non-banks have lent on. Pardon? We'll go back oh, again. Oh, certainly. This is... This is I, I won't use the word, but um, it in no way deals with the question. And I, I can't understand how a financial organisation, a strategic banking corporation, can write to the PAC as a result of a financial query and give us three pages back without the single mention of a single euro. Talk about a generalised response, hoping we'd accept it. We don't accept it. We, we don't, well, we, just, we acknowledge that, but we want a proper reply the next time. Okay? So, next item then is... 1789 from Mark Griffin, Secretary General, Department of Communications, Climate and uh, Data, 6th of December, providing information requested at a meeting last week. Um, these were in relation to contracts awarded without a competitive process. It's very useful detail. He's saying some of the issues relate to where there's very specialised, <coughs> unique expertise in the, only in the hands of maybe a very limited number of contractors or maybe only one in relation to some of the matters. So there's good information there. We'll not publish that. Deputy Cunnan. Yeah, um, well, I don't accept the responses that have come back, to be honest, and I think it raises uh, more questions in relation to the uh, procurement process. What we're talking about here is contracts which are awarded without competitive uh, contract, and there may be times when that you know, is, is the only outcome, but it seems to be an awful lot. And just to give a couple of examples, uh, the contract that was awarded for the North and South Corrib, the department says, and I'm reading from the, the red the board, it's, it's, it's the back page of, of yeah, the, uh, one second now. Item 10. Item 10, okay. Yeah, yeah, you have it there. So it gives a, a yeah, a brief and all. So the, the one for the, um, North and South Corp is that the contractors have the requisite ex expertise and knowledge to carry out the urgent assessments required and the contractor has specialist knowledge and an in-depth understanding of this complex project. But that doesn't necessarily mean that there isn't others in there. Um, it's not an excuse for not putting it out for tender or not having a tendering process. The same then with the contract to support the devel development of the National Mitigation Plan. It says the department says the the complete the, the, the process was shelved because the supplier is considered unique in terms of research it offers. Who considered the, the contractor unique? And again, I don't accept that. Um, that that's a reason why we don't have a, a, a tendering process. Uh, the same for the climate uh, N, M, uh, NMP modelling <coughs> contract of over six hundred thousand euro. Again, no competitive bids. Uh, and the department's reason is that the contractor has a specialist team. So I suppose like, there's, there's, a, there's a wider implication here as well in terms of, even if that was the case, right, even if these are unique specialist services, then why is the in-house expertise not being built up within the department, if that's the case? Um, but leaving that aside, I don't accept in all of these cases, because it was the same, if you remember, with the national broadband, uh, plan. It was, well, we've ended up with only one bidder because it seems only the only contractor left is the one that can do the job. Um, and we all know why that happened, because of privatisation. Um, but in terms of these particular ones, I don't accept it. There's an awful lot of contracts that are being put out, or sorry, that are being uh, uh, awarded without any competitive tension at all. And just giving us an excuse that we, we believe this is the only organisation or private company that can do the job doesn't cut it. I mean, I don't know if the CNAG has examined the correspondence. I, I think that uh, the point you raise is exactly the, the one we challenge um, these that we become aware of um, on the basis that demonstrate to us that this is the only person who can do this. Um, or, uh, I, and I, I think um, it's possibly a little clearer where um, you're locked into, um, uh, let's say, a, an ICT system and there is only a single supplier of licenses or 
uh, requisites for the um, for the the system. But then you look to see that the uh, procurement testing for that is done on, let's say, even if it's on a 10-year cycle, um, that there is proper full life recognition of the costs that are associated with the, the, the contract. So, it, it, you know, you, you can't just pick somebody and then decide now we're, we're tied that's to my that point, person. Uh, Mr. McCarthy, because what they're saying in terms of the National Mitigation Plan, that we consider it, we, it is, the supplier is considered unique, but who considers that this contractor is unique? And why isn't the test it? I mean, your and, point and the, is... the test is put it out to tender it, and see if they're only, if it is the only, only one, one that comes forward. Exactly. But that's not been done in a whole raft of areas. So I think we need to... Again, it's another problem in procurement. Um, no, you're, you're right. I was just noting and publishing it. And, you know, on an EU basis to say, in relation to looking at undergrounding electricity cables, you know, that the, the person has the requisite experience, etc., I'm sure there are lots of people in the EU um, for a contract of 100,000 could come forward if it was put out to tender. And, you know, the one that strikes me as well, following up what Deputy Colnan is saying in relation to item number four, the upgrade of the Department's financial management system, this yeah. 74 to say, to say the vendor is the sole supplier within Ireland of the software utilised by the Department's financial... So what? How, how did the Department pick a financial management system with only one supplier of that service in Ireland? It's nonsense to think... There, there's not a myriad of companies who could provide a financial management system to the department. So I think we'll write to them on the basis to give us a to, to give us an information note in relation to each of the items that you've mentioned, where there was either a sole supplier or these people had unique expertise. We want actually a note on each of them as to how they arrived at that conclusion. But I, I, I raised this before, and I know we have a very busy work schedule, and we have an awful lot to do but the broader issue of procurement. This is, again, another example yeah. of where there's problems. This time it's citing a lack of expertise in the marketplace and saying, well, there's only specialised companies in our judgment can do this work. In other areas, we've had maybe leaving it too late before they roll over contracts or put out contracts for tender. And then we know in the HSE, in the Department of Education, there's ongoing problems. So I had asked that we would... Because now we've, we've done it, it's, bit, it's sketchy, like we're coming at it, bits and pieces here and there, that we would join it all up and at some point do a report ourselves on procurement because the problem is there's no sanctions. Exactly. Okay. It's a slap on the wrist. <clears throat> it's a, a note at the end of the CNAG's report to say that there may be issues in relation to uh, non-adherence to procurement rules. We then give the accounting officer a slap on the wrist. There's no punishment, there's no sanction, there's no anything, and it, it continues on. Now, I know there were some improvements, to be fair, in, I think it was the HSE, yeah. if, if I'm correct, um, because of our work, but notwithstanding that, I think um, it's still coming up over and over again, and there's a lot of different reasons and a lot of different issues in relation to it. So I'm only asking, I know we're going to get to our work programme. Yeah. Can we look at it uh, procurement. as exactly as a standalone issue? Because it's it's the big one in terms of the spend of money. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I'm trying to come to terms with that, and I've raised it myself in relation to computer expect expertise. And so what's happening is there's less and less competition. That's the less and less competition. Yeah. That's the problem. In the guise of more competition, there's less and less. And we're struggling here piecemeal with it. So I certainly would welcome an opportunity to come back in a more comprehensive manner. We're just beginning to identify the problems. Right. Yeah. Okay. It's, a, it's a bit like the spin-off con companies. Well, it touching, barely yeah. touching. Okay. So look, at, we're going to write to the department on that basis of to give us a detailed explanation in relation to each of these where they had a sole contractor um, and to give us a narrative as to how, yeah. how they arrived at that conclusion. And for example, just one last one and move on. They paid €100,000 for the provision of legal advice regarding the Corrib gas field project. And the, the response to give is the reasons for not having a competitive process. The contractor has specialist knowledge and an in-depth understanding of this complex project. Well, we would certainly hope whoever was getting the contract had specialist knowledge and an understanding of the complex, or they shouldn't have got the job anyway. But to suggest that there's no one else in the country could have done it, it doesn't stand up from our perspective. OK, so we will come back to that. The next item of correspondence, then, is correspondence C. 
1774 um, from Senator Gerard Crockwell dated 3rd of December requesting the Committee to make inquiries regarding the expenditure by the Department of Defence defending High Court actions on its failure to implement the working time directive for the Defence Force. Um, I think we request a note from the Department. Deputy Colonel. Yeah, no, I think this is an important point, uh, issue that's been raised, one that's been raised with, with me as well. Uh, basically, the uh, Defence Forces are not subject to the Organisation of Working Time Act. In fact, that's similar acts are in place in other countries where they are, so we're quite unique in that area. But there's cases being taken, because we have no class action yeah. possibilities, obviously, in this state, individual cases are being taken by the trade union. And it seems that the WRC are siding with the workers in each and every case. Um, so I think rather than, again, dragging more and more workers through the WRC at, with the cost to the state, it would seem more sense that, make more sense to me that they would deal with the substantial issue. And it seems as well that the, from the WRC perspective that we're European Union competency, which it does have in this area, supersedes national law, then that's why, it's one of the reasons why they are uh, that they're, they're making the uh, judgments that they are, as the European Directive that he mentions here. So I think we just need to go back to him with, with that substantial point that, listen, if you're losing all these individual cases and you're faced with more cases, why don't you deal with the substantial problem here? Yeah, the base. OK, so we'll write to the Department on that basis. Yeah. And that's for reply. Final item of correspondence 1783 from an individual regarding a response from the University of Limerick in relation to the mediation process at the college. The individual does not refer to Dr. Fitzgerald. The individual does refer to Dr. Fitzgerald's item of correspondence, which we discussed earlier. The individual wishes to know if he is referred to in Dr. Fitzgerald's correspondence. It does not appear to be the case. I propose we note this item and inform the individual accordingly. We will be discussing our engagement with UL and whistleblowers in UL and part of our work program in a few moments. Okay, so that's agreed for that. Now, the next item is state. Can I just, just yeah. to, there's the, the, the issue I raised over the last number of weeks in relation to the costs for the Pope's visit yeah. and the procurement. Have we a reply on that yet? No, um, we haven't got it. I'm going to keep going yeah, after this. You will. No, I'm, I'm going to say this every yeah. single time. time yeah. um, so uh, it would be better if they just replied to us. Yeah, so um, look, at, because we won't <coughs> be meeting for a couple of weeks over the Christmas period, yeah. what we'll agree here now is once that reply is received, be immediately circulated, okay. rather right. than if it arrives tomorrow, we're not sitting on it and, next And week. the second item, um, it, which you suggested yourself, Chair, last week, was that we write to, I think it was the NTMA, about the percentage of, of uh, the Irish Infrastructure Irish Strategic Fund. Investment Fund yeah. in infrastructure. In, in relation to the MANS yeah. contract, specifically, um, where it was sold and... Yeah. Uh, uh, or it was purchased three months after it was extended. Absolutely. And uh, just repeat the question again. I know we somewhere. Yeah, they, <coughs> um, they extended. It. The percentage of the. the it, I mean, essentially, the Irish, what percentage of the Irish Infrastructure Fund is owned by, is the, owned by the state? Ireland Strategic Investment. I've uh, that note in front of me here yeah. today because I've read on several occasions. This Ireland Strategic Fund, which is a state-backed fund. Now we don't know is it backed by the Ireland Strategic Investment Fund for by one percent or ninety-nine percent. Yeah. We have no concept. And this phrase is out there. It's good PR to put out it's a state-backed fund. Maybe substantially or maybe it's very minuscule. I have no idea. Wasn't so there, we just want to test yeah. we need to know what level of what's their investment in Wasn't that. Wasn't there some relatively small given the amount that was in it, wasn't there some amount that was left following the, uh, the use of the pension fund? Oh, yeah. That's where the funding came from for the Irish strategic investment. Yeah, six billion Yeah, six billion. Yeah. Um, yeah, OK. Yeah, so I, I did come from part of that, and it's all now managed uh, in this, through, through this system. And as I say, the NTMA does publish this list of investments each year. I think they should be able to give it to us straight up. And uh, again, I'll ask if that information arrives in the near future, once that reply er arrives, um, I'd want to make sure that that reply from the state, about the state chair by Ireland Strategic Investment Fund in that company is circulated as soon as that reply. Um, and I presume that it will be on a, an investment by investment basis, that there would be, the different, there'd be different uh, percentages. 
So, well, they'll only be able to tell us their investment. They won't be able to tell us who the other shareholders are. No, I know are. that, but essentially they'll be able to do it by, by the investment in, say, the man's contract, say, in yeah. uh, building houses or whatever. They'll be able to tell us on a... But that's the, the but specific Infrastructure warning. Ireland are just involved in the broadband, or are they involved... No, in this case, that's what we're looking for. Yeah, the broadband, yeah. 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 We just deal with the broad... Really, yeah, uh, uh, this arose last week in the broadband debate, yeah. right? <coughs> we, we'll come back to... Oh, we asked separately about the $730 million by one of the other NTMA companies last week that had a special allocation for social housing. We've already agreed to write to them. We want to know how many houses are, have been built or are being built on a local authority by local authority basis. We covered that last week, so, so we covered the housing bit separately last week. Okay. So, just only a little yeah. question, just in relation to the correspondence that we, we dealt with it already, um, just from the Department of Education, PSC 32, PSC 32 1, 118. One. Yeah, it's about the publication of the minutes, just, and it, I welcome that. Does that, does that include... Oh, sorry, no, What date is it? Uh, the um, 3rd of December. Yeah, did we deal with this? You did, you've dealt with it. It's yeah, no, but just tell me again. Yeah, oh, yeah it's only to ask, do you yeah. want the reference again? Yeah. Oh, sorry. 118 is the last three. No, no, the last number. Oh, is that, that's the reference to our letter. Oh, yeah. I beg your pardon. I'm not yeah. looking at the wrong thing, am I? Yeah, yeah, but no. we'll, we'll find it now in a moment. It's only, it's only a specific question. You don't yeah. even need the letter. It's just, yeah. uh, we welcome the publication of the minutes. You know, does that include the reports, like the Finance Committee report that comes before? That won't be published. No, it's just the be meetings, isn't that right? <coughs> would, um, that, that meeting would include the Finance Committee report coming before them, wouldn't it, on the various CTBs? Well, in other words, does it include all documentation presented at a meeting? I don't know. No, probably not, probably not, but... Hmm? No, just the minutes at the moment. Okay, we we'll look at the minutes. I follow that. Up. And if, the, okay. if there's insufficient yeah. information in yeah. the minutes, we can come back and ask for further okay. information. Thanks, so Thanks. Let, let's test some of those yeah. Yeah. minutes, so. and then we'll see how we get on with them. And then we can certainly come back and ask um, for further information. Okay, so that's the end of correspondence, and we're now moving on to I statements and accounts received since the last meeting. I think there are four on the screen. And the Carbon Fund, the Clear Audit Opinion, the University College Dublin, the Clear Audit Opinion, and the usual issue about the deferred pensions in the third level in the education sector and payments totalling 5.4 million to 75 suppliers in respect to goods and services which procurement procedures did not comply with government procurement. Um, and then I just will group them all together. Limerick and Clare, ETB, Clear Audit Opinion, and the same issue, material level of non-compliance with national procurement rules, and Leash off the Education and Training Board, Clear Audit Opinion, and attention is drawn to the disclosure statement on the internal control that Leash and off the ETB would welcome an increase in internal audit resources, and we covered that last week. So here we go again. There's U UCD and Limerick and Clare, ETB, not in compliance with their public procurement guidelines. Is, is there any information on the statement of internal control in the, the accounts? There is, yeah. yeah. So look, for today we'll note that, and it's an issue we will be coming back to the procurement issue, mm -hmm. but for anyone who wants a breakdown or background on that, it's in the financial statements as published, which are laid before the doctors. So next item then is work programme, and essentially we want to talk about um, the meetings early in the year. And, um, Just Okay, so on the screen, um, we're not proceeding with the meeting with the prison service next week. Is that agreed? I think everyone has agreed to that. The time is very tight, and we will come back to that. So Thursday the 17th of January, we're actually having the meeting on the Thursday, the first meeting back with the Department of Justice in respect of the Irish prison service and uh, vote 21, the prison service. Okay, so I think that, hope that should be agreed. The next item... The following Tuesday, this is a se separate meeting. It's a private meeting with the whistleblowers and complainants in relation to the University of Limerick. Um, and I think we'll pencil, in that, we'll pencil in that day now, but when we go into private session for one other item, we might just have a brief discussion um, on the structure of that meeting, and we'll do that in private session in a moment. But we'll set that date for it now publicly. Thursday, the 24th of January, 
Uh, we're going to deal with the CNAG special report on Waterford Institute of Technology and his special report on remuneration of certain staff in the University of Limerick and the Institute of Technology Sligo. And we will have those organisations in and the Higher Education Authority and the Department of Education and Skills. That's the 24th of January. On the 31st, on, on the, all of these have to be confirmed. Uh, on the 31st of January, uh, we're back to our housing meeting. We'll have the Department of Housing Planning and Local Government and specifically the Irish Council for Social Housing. And we're dealing with the um, vote on housing and planning. Um, and we'll try and conclude our meeting in relation to housing at that meeting. Then on the 2nd of February, we have the vote from the Minister of Finance and the CNAG's report on Chapter 1 deals with the financial outturn for 2017. Chapter 2, the collection of pension contributions due to the Exchequer. Chapter 3, control of funding for voter public aid services. Chapter 22, the Irish Fiscal Advisory Council. So we'll have to make arrangements whether they'll take a separate slot at the meeting or be part of the bigger meeting, because I think they're meant to be independent. The main, we just have, we'll work the format of that. that Actually, house goes. Just, can I just say yeah. that last week I felt that we had a couple of people there that, in relation to cyber security, and we did really waste our time. Um, if, we're, if we feel that there's too much in, or we shouldn't be overlapping, I, I think it's... It's, it's not an efficient use of yeah. time. Well, the, in fairness, the last day, the people in cyber security only came, they, they weren't here on morning at all. I know that. Yeah, but I, they I were still sat. That. Look, it's just the politics of broadband took yeah. over, dominated. Like, if that issue hadn't happened, there was a myriad of items that I know deputies would want to discuss in that department yeah. in the normal course of events, which were hardly touched on at all huge, because the other one dominated. Issue. But, but <coughs> the Fiscal Council, so we'll see about arranging a, a separate half a 30 minutes not but they have made a presentation to the finance committee that's where they discuss that the vote the expenditure for you do an audit a small amount of money to the running of the fiscal council isn't it oh yes it's yeah, very yeah. small it's it, it actually small. just a yeah. minor issue that they're seeing it so we, but we might keep it just a separate yeah. 30 minutes on its own but, but we won't repeat the meeting that they've presented at the Finance Committee just quite recently, because they do that several times every year, so we won't, we won't duplicate their work. And then the finance accounts uh, for 2017, and that's the national central fund that I referred yeah. to, and we've mentioned that earlier, and so we'll discuss that on that day. Chairman, um, Chapter 2 there really is more a matter for deeper. Collection of pension contributions due to the extra. Okay, we'll hold that over. Um, pension contributions. Why, why is collection... Because the uh, the issue there is um, uh, instructions by um, uh, deeper for the surrender of uh, or uh, the, the collection of pension contributions in respect of uh, where there are charges for services, and um, th they've been running that pen pensions policy is a deeper issue rather than a finance issue. Okay, so we'll we'll, no, we'll, we'll hold that out separately. Then on Thursday the 14th of February, I suggest that. I'm suggesting that date, um, some of the people who are in the broadband industry, some of the providers, um, has been indicated some members are keen to have them in. Um, and it does broaden our knowledge and the public knowledge of the process. Just Valentine's Day. Pardon? Just Valentine's Day. Yeah, exactly. So that's the date. We'll we can come to who we're inviting to the private session. <laughs> yeah, the next, like on the 21st of Valentine's February, Day. we're dealing with the, the Kildare Wicklow ETB and the Department of Education and Skills. So hopefully we'll have... A, proper reports at that stage. Will we have the 2016 audit? Of? So you've just done the 15 or finishing the 15, huh? Just finishing the 15, you won't have 16 by then, I'd say. Yeah, it's hard to know, should we have a meeting on something four years old at that stage? Uh, well, I think this one is an important... It's worth having the meetings. Yes. Okay, lessons to be learned, lessons to be learned. And on the 28th of February, the Taoiseach's group of votes, so that's a group of votes, so we have to work the mechanism there because it deals with the vote for the Attorney General, the CSO, the Chief State Solicitor's Office, the DPP and the President's Establishment. Um, so you know, are there separate accounting offices yes. for those? So we might have to allocate an hour, or we might not get them all done, but we'll provisionally put them in at this stage. And then on 7th of March, uh, we're back to the Department of Justice for everything else in the Department of Justice outside of the prison service. And then there's other items on the work programme that we will set dates on. PPPs, we said we'd come back to the Dormant Accounts Fund. Um, 
procurement in the HSC, I think procurement generally is one. The sale of Harles Cross, we said we'd come back to that. We're, we're waiting for their correspondence. That's the racing track, the dog racing track. And we want to deal with the whole issue of protective disclosures, medical negligence, the state claims agency, broadband providers are on our list, and incontinence where a nursing home charges. That has been mentioned in correspondence, and I spoke to the person we were in correspondence with recently, indicating I would meet him in January. Um, but if they're to meet members of the committee, um, is this the person I'm in contact yeah, with. Yeah. So, what, what, what is that? I was requested at this stage. I wasn't quite sure. You said to the person I... Yeah, no, I think we got a bit confused last day. Yeah. As I understood it after our last meeting, and, uh, and uh, Deputy O'Connell was here at the time, uh, that, that we would ask the HSE, the Brothers of Charity wouldn't have to come, but we would ask them and, 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 and go through this, right? Because the issue was that um, they, they seemed to be applying rules and not everybody, people would be charged and some were reimbursed and others were reimbursed from a certain date but not the whole date and you know that the person who was in contact with me took took issue with uh, whatever information was provided to us by the HSE Ray Mitchell sent in a thing now unilaterally I've written my own rebuttal to Ray Mitchell putting a, a series of questions myself um, I just uh, sent it off there lately um, so I have no response so I, I think we, we, it would be good to have the HSE in with the Brothers of Charity on that relevant case, but, but Deputy O'Connell said, and I think others agreed at the meeting, that, that you might broaden out such yeah. a hearing to include other indirect charges yeah. being applied to, to residents, long-term residents in, in nursing homes and various homes. Um, yeah, I think we will discuss it, but definitely there's a broader issue of nursing home charges, of which that's one of the charges. So we'll discuss it in our context when we have the HSC. <coughs> in the meantime, um, I've given a commitment that I would meet the people who wrote to us directly in the, you know, in the new year in any event. And we'll circulate the time of that meeting and all members of the PAC, you know, it won't be a PAC meeting, we'll meet in the meeting room and any member who wants to come to that meeting, please do when we, we set the time for that. Okay? Can, so can I just raise some, uh, two things in relation to uh, the work plan? Yeah, um, no, yeah on the work programme. That's the what work we're programme. Yeah. State claims agency. Yeah. Um, that doesn't seem to be factored in here. Um, I, uh, sorry, is it wrong? It's, it's not on the schedule, but it's in the outstanding matters. No date for it yet. It's in yeah. the bottom of the chart. We have medical negligence, state claims agency correspondence. So. In terms of, we, that needs to be a bit broader than that. That's the point I was making earlier. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah, so uh, it's the state claims agency, including medical negligence, is yeah. the way we phrase it. The risk right. management side, I think, is well worthwhile looking at. Yeah. Um, and the second item in relation to the HSE, which is not on this, and I'm raising it for the first time, is there, there is definitely an issue in relation to, for example, the HSE uh, outsource, not to Section 38s and 39s, um, the uh, adult services, for example, for people with disabilities. Um, and uh, essentially how that's handled um, and how it's supervised and the amount of money that's provided. Um, I think that that is something that at some point in, in the first half of next year, I, th I think it would be well worthwhile uh, mm -hmm. looking at that very specifically. And is this outside Section 38 and outside Section 39? Huh? Yeah, it would be. <coughs> what kind it's of organisation like would it be? For example, there's a myriad of organisations now uh, that provide services, say, for uh, adult services for people with autism, for example, yeah. that it's straight after kind of secondary school or mm. whatever, or indeed where there is, um, where there is a, an agency doing the work that's been super, supervised directly by the HSE. Yeah. Um, there's, I come across reasonably yeah. often issues that uh, uh, that are presented in relation to failures in that particular on that in that particular side of things where services say services are are services are supposed to be provided but then are maybe inappropriate and the person doesn't yeah. go to the service so in actual fact it's being paid for but the service is not being is, is not being used it's the level of supervision of that and the inadequacy of the services then that result as a consequence would you, would you put in a note I will, yeah. so we okay. then will write to the HSE on it because yeah. I understand the point we understand we all have probably examples of that yeah. but 
maybe to be specific. Just give us a specific okay. note, and then we'll get a, a response, and then we'll have the, that, that issue moving before the HSC comes before us. So, um, next item then is I, before the witnesses come in, we just want to go into private session just for a couple of moments. So. We touched on thalidomide the last time that they were in. Yeah. I, I, like we're, 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 the outstanding issue of the eight or nine people. I, I, I'd like to pursue that with them again, really, because uh, I think we posed a number of questions the last time, and, and I don't really feel that they got adequate answers. And, and of the of the eight or nine people that are left who are thalidomide but aren't being accepted as being being part of the scheme or whatever. One is a judge, one works here in the house, and um, it, it's not a huge amount of money, and I think that, that, um, that, that we could be more compassionate about how we're dealing with it. I don't know whether other members... Right. Might. And did we raise it the last Mr. Chair, I agree with that, just in the sense that this came up more by accident, really, when we looked at the cases that were set out in the annual report, and we began to ask a few questions in relation to it. And I do think we need to tease it out. There are 34 live cases, as I understand it, yeah. and that figure has changed. I, 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 have, I, I do think we need to tease it out in terms of... Um, I, I agree. I, I agree. Yeah, yeah, so do yeah. I. Yeah. Yeah, so just on that, there were acknowledged, yeah. acknowledged my cases, unacknowledged thalidomide yeah. cases. There were so many levels that was just emerging 50, 60 years afterwards. We're still, I, so I agree. That, that issue was raised at the meeting, and we'll ask the Secretary to go back for that aspect of the transcript and ask for, because that issue was raised the last I, 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 I raised it at the time, yeah. and then it, it, we got subsequent correspondence that filled out the information, and we got more information, but it's, it seems to, it's, it's unfolding. So I, I certainly would like it included for the State Claims Agency are in. Yeah, yeah. but we'll write to them in the meantime, uh, based on what we did discuss at the meeting, because I'm looking at the letter we had here this morning, reference number 1768, and the heading is matters related to medical negligence, open disclosure, and cervical check, thalidomide related mitigation. And now, I mightn't be doing the State Claims Agency a favour, but I'm glancing through that correspondence and I don't see... They did send a previous, in fairness to them, they did send a previous piece of correspondence where they outlined the cases. Okay, yeah. so, so in this correspondence, what I will ask the Secretary to do, in the correspondence here today, and uh, the one I just referred to on page, um, page 3, um, paragraph 1, 2, 3, paragraph 4 deals with the thalidomide issue and... Um, Um, so yeah, there's an interesting issue. I see a last sentence there. Subsequently, the Chief State Solicitor's Office, due to pressure on resources in its office, came off record in the thalidomide matters and was replaced by Hayes Solicitors, the firm with an established track record in the defence of medical products, liability litigation. For transparency purposes, payments to counsel, whether on or off panel, are published biannually on the State Claims Agency's website. No payments have been made to any of the State Council in the thalidomide cases. So I'll ask the Secretary to go through that response today and the earlier response, and if there's any outstanding question from the day we were here, um, yeah, we'll, 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 yeah, we'll ask the Secretary my, my, to My concern is it's not, of course, the State can't be a soft touch or anything yeah. like that, but I mean, we're talking about eight or nine people, yeah. uh, and it's been defended in the High Court. And we have Hayes on record, a private firm that's obviously incurring costs to the state and all that kind of stuff. And I just think, you know, um, you know the state's default position will be defend every case. And I, and I just think, you know, I, I, I'd love to know why, why we're throwing money at this. There's so few people who clearly aren't a little might sufferers. Um, and, you know, I'd, I'd like an explanation on that. Because okay. it, it, we it will. might be much cheaper to mediate and, and, get, it, and get it done. Okay. So we'll write to them on that basis that um, to explore mediation further, because I'm sure that there are Deputy Connolly is looking at me, maybe. I I'm, just don't no, think I'm we should. trespassing across I do, I do. Okay. I think we should have them before us and we should ask questions in yeah. relation to and get okay. as much information, but I don't think we should be directing them in No, I don't think we yeah. can trespass yeah. on how they yeah. defend their case. Yeah. Okay? So we'll be clear on that. We can certainly highlight it and yeah. then... Yeah, well, we can. Yeah. Is it, yeah, we, you know, yeah. is it, I mean, apart from, I mean, it's okay if somebody runs into my car, yeah. man, I'm going to waste 10 grand suing them unless they have money. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, like, 
Okay. What's the cost-benefit analysis right. in pursuing aid people? I, yeah. I'm, from, I'm, from, from, I'm only objecting to the direction. Oh, I, 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 I agree. agree. Yeah. 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 So look at, we raised the issue today that we're here. We've had two items of correspondence from them in the meantime. I'm asking the Secretary to check the two items of correspondence and if they haven't answered it, the issue is raised and the leader yeah. will go back and ask for I it. Think and so there will be in again. Yeah, sorry, I think the issue is the, the mediation led. It was confirmed that mediation was ongoing. Yeah. That it says it in the yeah. transcript. And then subsequently it, that was explained that nobody has officially terminated it. Correct. But there has been no mediation yeah. since December um, 16. Just so, it just, so that they're all their issues to be explored, really, yeah. to be clarified. It's not happening, even yeah. though in theory is yeah. in place. I mean, it, it comes back to, and I, I, I think we should, we really do need to get, to have a look at the structure of the state claims agency in terms of how they, and I don't think we've done that sufficiently, uh, the whole issue of open disclosure and whether or not, because it became very clear when we were looking at the um, cervical check issue that really you nearly had to, you had to uh, go to the court and, um, you know, more or less issue proceedings um, before it, it, the state claims agency even knew about it. It just didn't seem that there was a mechanism to really uh, do open disclosure in a in, in a way that, uh, that that was non-legalistic, if you if, if you like. That absolutely has to be part of of what we do in relation to um, the the look we're taking at the state claims agency, because we're going to keep on having to go back on individual streams of work that relate to different, uh, you know, different things like cervical check or thalidomide, unless we actually get to that. Um. Okay. Yeah, okay, and just in general, the, it's a related point how long things take is to say in relation to some of the catastrophic infants cases, the State Claims Agency and the correspondence, they say that the agency only ever becomes involved when a letter of claim is received. Yeah. So by that time, the solicitor has done all the research and all the work, yeah. and then they're submitting their claim, and it's only at that stage, and they use the phrase, this, this, this has inevitable consequences as the, the state claims agency has to start to play catch up, as it can only commence its liability and cause of, cause of creation investigation when it receives a letter of claim. So by definition, the system is geared that there's going to be a significant time lag. That, that, just, you know, there's another example of it. So we will have the state claims agency again, in again, but we will write to them in the meantime if there is a gap in the issues that we raised within the last day. Yeah. And there will be in again, as part of the work program. So I think at this stage now, we are, um, we're now going into private session. So, so we're now in private session. Today we'll be examining the following, the Controller and Auditor General Special Report number 98 on the provision of school transport. And we're joined today by officials from the Department of Education and Skills, Sean Falou, Secretary General, Ned Coslo and Richard Dolan. And they're accompanied by representatives from Bosairn, Mr. Stephen Kent, CEO, Tom Delaney and Miriam Flynn. And I'd also like to welcome officials from the Department of Transport, Deirdre Hanlon, Assistant Secretary and Kevin Dial. And can I remind members and witnesses and those in the public gallery that all mobile phones should be turned off completely. That means airplane mode, putting them in silent will interfere with the recording system. <coughs> um, I wish to advise witnesses that by virtue of 17 to 1 of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect to the evidence to the committee. If you are directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter only to qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given and you are to ask to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that where possible you should not criticise or make charges against any person or persons or entity by name or in such a way as to make him or her it identifiable. Members are reminded of the provision of Standing Orders 186 that the Committee shall refrain from inquiring into the merits of a policy or policies of the Government or a Minister of the Government or the merits of the objectives of such policies. Um, while we expect witnesses to answer questions put to the committee, by the Committee clearly and with candour, witnesses can and should expect to be treated fairly and with respect and consideration at all times in accordance with the witness protocol. So at this stage I'll ask the CNAG for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman. 
Special Report number 98 looks at the arrangements in place for the provision of school transport. The examination was carried out to ascertain whether the Department of Education and Skills can demonstrate that it is achieving value for money through its arrangements with Bosairn to deliver the school transport service and whether there is adequate oversight of the service by the Department. The special report was based on financial and service data related to 2015. The briefing material provided by the Department includes data for later periods and there have been some subsequent uh, significant developments which the Accounting Officer will explain. However, the key findings of the report are likely to still apply, so I, I will present them as reported. Primary school children are eligible to avail of school transport services if they live not less than 3.2 kilometres from their nearest suitable school. The eligibility minimum distance for post-primary pupils is 4.8 kilometres. Pupils who do not qualify under the eligibility rules may use the school transport service if there is spare capacity on a bus route. These are known as concessionary ticket holders. Eligible children who hold a medical card and special needs pupils are exempt from charges for availing of the service. The cost to the Department of School Transport Services in 2015 was 173 million euros, or close to 1 million euros per school day. The bulk of the cost is accounted for by payments to Bus Ern, which received 149 million euros in 2015, or 86% of the amount spent by the Department. Bus Ern also collected just under 14 million euros in fees from fair paying pupils. The balance of the expenditure by the Department is accounted for by various grants, including for special needs escorts and transport grants. The average annual cost of transporting eligible pupils was around €1,800 Euros ahead in 2015. Fees recouped from fair-paying pupils amounted to just over 8% of the cost. While there has been a steady increase in the total number of enrolments in primary and post-primary schools over the past decade, the number of pupils who are eligible and who avail of the school transport service has fallen significantly. In, 20, in 2007, the number of eligible pupils who availed of the scheme was 127,000, or 16% of enrolled pupils. By 2015, this had dropped to 89,000, or 10% of enrolled pupils. The school transport bus fleet is made up of a mix of large, medium and small buses. Taxis are also used to transport some pupils with special needs. Much of the service is subcontracted by Bus Aaron to private bus and taxi operators. Payments to subcontractors accounted for 71% of the cost of the service provided by Bus Aaron in 2015. Based on assumed average carrying capacities for vehicle types, we estimated the bus fleet as a whole had a potential carrying capacity of 163,000 pupils in 2015. Relative to the number of eligible pupils, the estimated level of spare carrying capacity in the fleet was 48%. Some of this spare capacity is taken up by concessionary ticket holders, but the estimated residual spare capacity in 2015 was still significant, about 35%. There was also evidence that some ticket holders do not use the transport available on a daily basis, resulting in, resulting in further underutilisation. At the same time, there is local demand in certain areas for concessionary access to school transport services that cannot be accommodated. The examination also looked at the oversight arrangements in place between the Department and Bus Ern. We found that in 2015, the Department was still relying on arrangements that had been uh, put in place for, our, for over 40 years, contained in a 1975 document entitled Summary of Accounting Arrangements. I concluded that the accounting arrangements provided for in the 1975 agreement are inadequate given the level of costs involved. Reporting requirements are weak and there is an absence of key performance indicators or other metrics that would allow the Department to assess service performance and the achievement of value for money. And I recognise that there have been some uh, developments since uh, in the report was completed in relation to um, service level agreement. The accounting arrangements provide for the Department to pay an annual lump sum transport management charge to cover Bus Aaron's indirect and unspecified other direct costs. 
the charges provided for in the agreement at 13% of direct costs. By agreement between Bossairn and the department, the management charge was capped at 16.7 million euros in 2011, at 15 million euros a year between 2012 and 2014, and at 11.3 million euros for 2015. Information provided by Bossairn to the department on the costs to be met from the management charge indicates that notwithstanding the cap, the amount paid was in excess of costs in each of the four years to 2014, resulting in an accumulated surplus being held by Bossairn, estimated by the department at 11.2 million euros at the end of 2015. The report includes a number of recommendations for improvement in the oversight and accounting arrangements. The accounting officer will be able to brief the members in regard to implementation progress in that regard. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Fallou, we now have your opening statement. Thank you. I thank the Chairman and the Committee for the invitation to appear before us. Um, I'm not going to read out my full opening statement given the tightness of time, so what I'll focus on is our response to the recommendations, Chair. So, uh, the Department's general agreement with the recommendations uh, is recorded in the, C in the CNAG's report, and as the CNAG has stated, progress has been made on, on implementing these since that time. On forecasting, while the school transport scheme continues to be a demand-led scheme, in planning for projected demand, the Department liaises closely with the National Council for Special Education in regard to the projected enrolment trends at primary and post-primary. The Department is undertaking a route audit with independent professional advice to ensure that route design is optimised from a value for money point of view, taking into account the location of eligible children. In the process of preparing for that review, the Department worked with Bus Aaron on the digitisation of its route maps. The Department has strengthened the governance framework around school transport and continues to do so. We have worked with Bus Aaron to put in place a number of additional elements of our governance framework which builds upon the 1975 arrangement that underpins our relationship with Bus Aaron in relation to school transport provision. A service level agreement has been put in place between the two organisations. This sets out the reporting arrangements in place between the two organisations, the roles and responsibilities of both organisations, the, the agreed outputs to be delivered by Bus Aaron, and the key performance indicators for the operation of the scheme. This agreement is currently under review and it is intended that an updated service level agreement will be put in place in 2019 with a view to further strengthening the governance framework around school transport. Also in the context of reporting and performance monitoring, certain overhead costs and other indirect costs attributable by Bus Aaron to the school transport scheme are known collectively as the transport management charge. The department commissioned an independent expert to carry out a review of the apportionment methodology in relation to this. This report was completed in March. The report provides a detailed analysis and classification of the costs incorporated into the charge. Based on the recommendations of this report, the Department has developed a reporting framework and we are currently working with Bus Aaron with a view to completing these reports, uh, initially on a biannual basis with a view to moving to a quarterly basis. In addition, the Department has been undertaking steps to reduce the accumulated surplus arising from the charge. The surplus of €11.2 million Euro recorded in the CNAG's report will be eliminated by the end of the current year. In regard to the final recommendation, all operational meetings between the Department and Bus Aaron are minuted and agreed by all attendees as a standing item agenda. While it did not generate recommendations, it is noted that a central part of the CNAG report was an examination of Bus Aaron's procurement processes and the report records that Bus Aaron was compliant with public procurement guidelines. I would just like to mention two other areas of note in relation to the school transport scheme. The first concerns concessionary transport. And the purpose of the school transport scheme, having regard to resources, is to support the transport of ch children who are remote. We've heard about the distance uh, criteria. So families of eligible children living in areas where it, is, where it is uneconomic to provide a transport service are eligible. And they're also eligible for the remote uh, area grant towards the cost of making private transport arrangements if, they if there isn't a service available. A number of non-eligible children are also transported in those circumstances where bus places are available after all eligible children are catered for. The transport is provided in the interest of maximising the utilisation of the existing fleet and also in providing a service to families where the capacity exists to do so. Since the number of spare places is dependent on the number of eligible children requiring transport, there can be no guarantee from year to year of a place for those who do not meet the eligibility criteria. 
in relation to special, the special needs scheme, the purpose of our scheme it, having regard to available resources is to support the transport to and from school of children with special education needs arising from a diagnosed disability. In general, such children are eligible for school transport if they're attending their nearest recognised mainstream school or unit that is or can be resourced to meet their needs. And eligibility is determined following consultation with the National Council for Special Education through its network of CENOs. So the Department and Buzz Aaron were both very conscious of the specialised nature of the transport provision for, for these children, and this is reflected in the standard of service provided by Buzz Aaron, factoring the individual requirements of children concerned into the planning of these services, which generally operate on a door-to-door -door basis, and the, children are, the eligible children are exempt from school transport charges. Um, just to conclude, um, at a cost of almost £190 million in 2017, school transport re represents a significant expenditure of taxpayers' money. The scheme is under financial pressure from increasing demographics at primary and post-primary level, but more significantly from the increase in the numbers of children with special education needs being transported. While cognizant of the costs associated with the scheme and having taken on board the recommendations of the TNHE's report, the Department is continuing to strengthen the process to ensure value for money in the delivery of the school transport scheme, while also ensuring that all eligible children are accommodated with school transport services. I'm very happy to provide further information sought and to respond to questions from the committee. And as you said, Chair, we're joined by Boss Aaron at the meeting. Thank you indeed, Mr. Falou. And now, Mr. Kent, uh, we'll have the opening statement from your staff. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, I'm here and joined today by Miriam Flynn, who's our Chief Schools Officer, and Tom Delaney, who's our Chief Financial Officer. And together, we're, they've joined me as part of a new senior management team at Bus Aaron, so we're very pleased to be here to answer any questions and to assist the examination of the findings of the CNAG report. Um, just a, by way of background, we want to say we've been operating the school transport scheme successfully now for over 50 years. Uh, again, for clarity, we don't exercise discretion in relation to the policy, and all of the applications are simply dealt with in accordance with the rules and the guidelines. It's important to note at the outset that the delivery of our operation on the ground is highly complex and the scheme is administered by Bus Aaron on a cost recovery basis only. The scheme has expanded dramatically uh, in terms of vehicle numbers as the amount of services provided under the scheme has increased from 1,700 contractor vehicles in 1998 <laughs> to in excess of 4,500 now and more than 460 new school transport services were approved by the department and introduced by Bus Aaron in 2017. And this year alone, there's been another 300 new services that would be introduced by Bus Aaron on behalf of the department. And the vast majority of these will cater for children with special education needs. All of the newly sanctioned services are open to public tender by Bus Aaron. So in relation to the management of the overall network, 95% of the Bus Aaron fleet, they operate two double trips daily with the bus used for different school runs, both morning and evening. So that would comprise two return trips. And then for over 60% of the contractors we use, they also uh, operate double trips. And it's important to note here that 83% of the costs of the scheme comprise payments to contractors. But due to the nature of the special education needs, where the individual needs of a child are taken into account, many of these services are operated in single vehicles on a door-to-door -door basis. In relation to procurement, over 90% of the routes are subcontracted to private operators. And every year, 20% of these routes are, t are, are tendered on an annual basis in compliance with the EU guidelines on procurement. We welcome the finding of the CNAG report, which demonstrates that Bus Aaron is fully compliant with, with, compliant with public procurement standards. And this is testament to our stringent and equitable standards, which we apply to all the procedures and practices. Uh, the CNAG report did highlight a number of opportunities for improved governance. And I'll just touch on those in terms of how we participate. So there has been the introduction of a service level agreement. There are monthly operations meetings in place to review periodic financial and operational reports. And every quarter, um, there's a meeting now with the CEO and with the, C with the senior officials in the department. And just to give you some context of the information that we have to cover off on that, is that we provide a, a formal budget and projected cost for the financial year. They are all agreed at the start of the year and they, they consider both the internal and external cost drivers, any emerging trends. We try to anticipate the level of demand and take into account policy developments that might have a bearing on the cost headings each year. We prepare a schedule of monthly payments. They are based on the number of school days each month, the mode of transport and the eligible children travel. And we give all of that to the department at the beginning of each year, and it's designed to provide an estimate of the annual projected cost. 
These figures are reviewed then every single month and they're amended as required. And sometimes they have to change, for example, if there was a status red warning and the cost may have to uh, be, be reviewed. Individual statutory accounts are not produced for school transport as it is not structured as a separate company within our company, Bus Airing. All of the finances pertaining to school transport are audited and a separate statement of account for the school transport scheme is prepared as part of the company's annual independent audit. We are very committed and to providing the highest levels of transparency to the department across all of the cost allocations. We have engaged specifically with the department on allocations related to indirect costs of staff, property and IT costs. And these three constituents, they account for nearly 85% of the indirect charges. And most recently, again, we're in joint agreement that all of these costs are demonstrably related to school transport. A biannual review is in place to ensure that the basis for cost allocation is robust and transparent. And bus airing accounts are fully audited by Deloitte. An additional audit of all of our school transport activity is undertaken to comply with the summary of accounting arrangements in line with the 1975 agreement. This year, uh, and taking on account of what the CNAG are saying, bus airing are in discussions with our auditors regarding a separate audit under the general account accepted accounting principles for the school transport part of our business. Our accounts in 2017 noted that a 6.7 million ring fence surplus was held within its reserve uh, on behalf of the department, and this would only be used solely for future expenditure on school transport related activities. In recent years, this has included a spend in, in the, on the creation of a new online ticketing system, improved telephony, call management system, and new school buses, all of which were authorised by the department. Currently, there's no surplus in reserve, and our 2018 financial statements will support this position. On the subject of special needs, the scheme has evolved in recent years, and I think that's well recognised with significant growth in the provision of transport for special education needs. Uh, this year, we have received in excess of 3,000 new individual special education need applications or amendments to services, and this contributes to the growing cost of providing services. It's also worth noting that while the volume of work has increased because it is complex to deliver, there has not been a corresponding increase in the cost of administration associated with this. In conclusion, uh, our company, Bus Air, we welcome the expansion of the scheme in recent years, uh, and we are very conscious that we must continue to strategically refine our own resources, our processes, procedures and our technology support to ensure we meet its growing needs. And we would do all of that in close liaison with the Department of Education and Skills. We are committed to full transparency and we want to continue the close cooperation as, as the scheme evolves. We fully enforce the rules of the scheme, we comply with the performance requirements of the service level agreement and Every day we try to deliver the highest standards of safety, consistency and reliability for all of the students who avail of the school transport scheme on behalf of the state. In conclusion, I would say we have been operating the school transport scheme for over 50 years and we look forward to continue to provide this vital service into the future. Thank you <coughs> indeed, Mr Kent. And we'll move on now to our opening speaker, Deputy Aylward, who's 20 minutes. Deputy Connolly is... 15 and we're down to 10 minutes now, so I'm going to ask people to stick strictly to the time limit to, and uh, note your name, uh, Deputy O'Brien, um, because we want to get out of here before the um, taking into account the Dáil Chamber business, so I'll be stricter than normal on time. And if there is the time for somebody to get back in a second time, well and good. So Deputy Elder, 20 minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and I welcome the three, the, the Department of Education, Bus Air and the Department of Transport here, and say, at the outset, I have to say, it is a good system to roll out of the bus service for school. I, I availed myself when, for secondary school uh, in 1968, a good few years ago now, and um, it was a great uh, scheme that was rolled out, but there's always a but and I'm a rural TD, and every August onwards, or September, July, August onwards, I have a headache, in, I'm from Kilkenny, and a headache I have every year as a public representative with concessionary tickets in, in particular, and that's where I'm going to dwell on a lot on it today. Um, you know, uh, as I said, the service is good, but for people that are left behind, it's not, and that's the problem we have. And there's a lot of problems out there, and I have them on a daily basis for, for months and months. And still come to me, even to, uh, last week I had a person in here in the Dáil from my own constituency uh, uh, with uh, four children. The problem is now, nowadays most parents are working nowadays. And it isn't like years ago where there was one parent staying at home and uh, there was one breadwinner and then one staying at home. It's all changed that now. Uh, both parents have to work now, and their children are going to school and just try to get them to and fro. And 
We did some research, when I say we, the Fianna Fáil party did some research, I think in 19, uh, 2016 for the general election, and I think we did it again, we re updated this year. And we're, t we're told that 350 concessionary pupils were, uh, well, didn't get the services this year, and uh, we're, I'm told by our researchers that 4 million would cover that, 4 million would cover. Now, that's simplified it. I know there's other... For ye to roll it out, it's a different job. But 4 million is small money in, the, in overall. I know it's just taxpayers' money, but small money overall. And I think uh, the Department of Education should look at this again, and the Minister should look at it. And I'm at the Minister the whole time and continuously at him with years and years to, to bring in some. I think there was a recession, and we did make changes to the rules back in 2009 or 10 or something like that, and changed the whole criteria. But now that we're out of recession, we should review it again and look back at it and look after these. 300, if I'm right about the 350 children that are left behind this year, I'm, I'm told, and look after them and try to include them in the service overall. And I uh, just want to ask you a comment on that first before I start to ask the question. So I go to Mr. Furu. Thanks, Deputy. Um, I suppose that the issue about concessionary is a key part of it and how we organise the scheme basis, on the basis of eligible pupils first and then concessionary pupils. All pupils are supposed to have applied for transport uh, by the end of April and then anybody, uh, all payments are supposed to be made by towards the end of July. And the first problem we have is that people don't necessarily all apply on time and don't necessarily pay fees on time. And that, that's a challenge in terms of organising the routes. But then wh when you get past that, we obviously, Bus Aaron on our behalf, have to organise the routes on the basis of the people. Con they, they start on the basis of the people who have applied and they implement them on the basis of the people who have paid. And then once all the eligible who have paid have filled up the seats, the, the remaining seats are available for concessionary. And, and there are a, a, a large number of concessionary children travelling on school transport. It's in the 17-18 school year, just over 27,000. Uh, this year, there were uh, just, just around about 3,000 uh, just applicants uh, who applied for concessionary transport who, who didn't, have, didn't receive concessionary transport. Uh, of those, just 1,129 applied on time but didn't secure a seat, and 1,888 applied uh, late and didn't receive a seat. So it's just around about 3,000. If we now we're speculating on, on a scheme here, and look, I, 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 it's a matter for a government to make policy, but I, I don't mind just t taking this a little distance, I suppose. If we were to have a scheme where concessionary transport was available to everyone, I think we would have a different number of applicants. I think th th those applicants are on the basis of the scheme we have at the moment, not on the basis of a, a putative scheme that may provide transport for all concessionaries. We were very conscious of this being an issue. Obviously, in the establishment of this government, we had a review and we published the outcomes of the review. And we are continuing further work in relation to the, the nature of concessionary. And is there any way we can seek to meet some of the need that has been identified? For example, if there's a it's not a, if not for individuals, but if there's a, a I suppose, a, a large group of concessionaries seeking to go a certain distance who may already be eligible for school transport. So we are exploring options in that regard, and yes, they would cost money. I think they'd probably cost more than the figure you've referred to, because obviously you have to organise transport. We, but we are, we are looking at that. But one of the tensions we have in the scheme is we have a scheme where costs are going up, especially on the special education side, and we also have a tension, and it's an appropriate tension, to provide a social service to people who, who want to have it, and that's, you know, that's, that's the tension always. And we, 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 we want to make sure that we strike the right balance, and that balance is obviously in the rules of the scheme and so on. So yes, we recognise it's a difficult issue, uh, and, but I, I, I'm not sure it's as small as you've set out, and I'm not sure it's even as small as I've set out, in terms of if we had an open choice to be transported anywhere up to a certain distance limit, that could actually cost a huge amount of money. But obviously there, there, may, be, there may be room to, to to develop the scheme slightly, and we're looking at whether that's a possibility, and that would obviously cost money if we were to do that. Ways. I just give an example. I keep giving examples from my own position. I, I suffer myself from going through that. Is that you know, there's a bus that passed to a little small place, and there's 40 seats on the bus. Now there's seven children left there going into Kilkenny. They're left there. 
you know, it wouldn't cost an awful lot to make it a 50 seat on bus and, 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 and look at it. I'm just giving you examples. I'm giving you examples. Oh, you don't agree with the concessionary uh, as the criteria is laid out. Those changes made, it's not your fault. I know that's made by us here, in, in, the, in, in here as politicians. The concessionary, I take our schools. I'm from a little place called Valley Hill in South Kilkenny. In 1968, the schools were magnumated, three schools, all magnumated into one. For 30 years, or for 30, sorry, 40 years, uh, there were no problem. The school made everything worked. I travel to primary school now. Everything worked beautiful. And then all of a sudden, these changes were made. And I, I and grandchildren now are going to that school, um, and that school. But they're being told, after 40 years getting that service in one, in one parish, uh, continuously, they're being told, because of the changes made here, that they should go to a different parish because the school is there. Now, that's crazy stuff. That doesn't work in, if you know the loyalty of parishes in, in, in rural areas in particular, and I talk to all rural areas, but this is basically where I come from. If you know the loyalty of your parish, yeah, even religious wise, you're born, you get baptised, you confirmation, communion, everything. And oh, that's going on for generations. And you try that. You're Holland, football, whatever you soccer, wherever you play, the sport is all to that parish. And didn't come along. Well, one strike with a pen up here, we make a change in 2010 or whatever, 11, whatever it was made. And we tell them, after three generations at this stage of being getting service at all, oh no, you must go to your near school, which is, uh, uh, I measure one, a quarter kilometre from one, one family with three children were told they have to go to a, a different school out there, outside the parish, completely have no, you know, I mean we all know one another, but the, you know, the loyalty is to your parish and they're told because of this criteria and you're splitting siblings, you're splitting brothers and sisters, tell them two who are in area are going to one school and then telling the next lot that they must go to an outside parish out here, which is nearer by, by, uh, by kilometres, but it's not near in any other way. So, I mean, that's a crazy situation. I think we need to review this. I'm not saying it's your fault, it's we need to review it. I'm asking the Minister to review it. I'm asking my own party to review it, and I'm hoping that we will get a review shortly. So, can you make a comment on that? about individual situations, but I'll comment, I'll comment about the situations in principle. Um, if, if we were to say to bus Aaron, you can run bigger buses where there isn't enough eligible pupils for them, that's a policy change that costs money. It can be done, but it's a policy change that costs money, and it would have to be applied across, across the country in all areas where rather we, we have to have a consistent national policy. So, yes, that could be done, but yes, it could cost a lot of money because bus iron run buses of different sizes at different times. So yes, it can be done, but yes, it could cost a lot of money. In relation to the amalgamations, um, I, th I think that the view was taken, the policy view was taken arising from the VFM, that, that and there's, an, there's a very good example in the VFM actually of, of a few schools who happened to be in the same Catholic parish, and they were Catholic schools, where parents were living close to one school, but they only closer to one school, but only could get school transport to the school further away. It, 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 to be to be honest, we can't set a scheme in stone in relation to amalgamations which were made 50 years ago. Uh, we, did no, for, we did for 40. We did for 40, but you can't set it in stone, and it was reviewed. The other thing is, this is about school transport. Parents can choose to send their children to other schools if they wish. I know there are challenges on parents to get students to different schools and transport and so on. This is not requiring them to attend school. Parents can choose which school to attend, obviously subject to there being places in schools. This is about the availability of school transport to support that. I would draw that distinction because I think it's an important distinction. But if we introduced and kept the level of choice to allow people to go to somebody under the former closed or close school rule, as well as the closest school, which, we, which was the policy dilemma, we would then have a myriad of choice. And a myriad of choice on transport costs a huge amount of money. I think it's a reasonable policy to say that the state will support a child to go to their nearest primary school. And if a parent wishes to choose them to go to a different primary school, that's a reasonable choice for a parent to make, but the choice that the parent can make and arrange it themselves. Well, would you not think there should be some recognition of par parishes, in, in particular rural Ireland, uh, in, in the criteria laid out? I understand. I, I'm not talking about children or parents that want to pick special schools for their children and want the, the state to pay for it. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about going to a primary school in, uh, here where there's only one primary school anyway in the parish, uh, having choices. But, uh, 
And after 30, 40 years of the grandparents, parents, and now grandchildren, and all of a sudden they're being told, no, it's closed, it's closed. I think that there's, I think there's actually a right to those people to give the same, to get the same service as they were promised in 1968 and they had for 40 years, and now it's changed. But it's stroke my pen, I said up here. I think that, that actually if someone went to court and brought to court to say, well, we, that's why we always at the school, right? I think the, the government would be bound by it. Yeah. No, nobody is saying that they can't attend the school. It's the availability of services. I'm talking about the school service. I'm talking about individually. I'm talking about the school service. The bus service. The policy doesn't doesn't recognise uh, parish boundaries of of the, of the Catholic Church. No. And well, I'm talking about Catholic Church. I'm talking about all churches. Though. Well, then they, the parish boundaries. I mean, then you'd be into a myriad of different boundaries, set depending on what the religion was. I don't think that's a reasonable thing for the for well, the state to actually, do. Actually, I don't want to go in personal, but there in Kilkenny, there's a, a, another school uh, because of another faith that he's getting that privilege and being brought to it, and uh, it's caused a lot of anxiety. And I don't want to go into anything personal yeah. here. It's caused a lot of anxiety well, we, in in where there is another faith uh, getting the service, and only of that faith is being brought to it, and that's I think that's wrong too, and it's caused a lot of problems in. Um, in my area. Well, I mean, the, the scheme at primary level allows for uh, children to attend the nearest school of their choice, whether it's multi-denominational, Catholic, uh, Protestant or Irish medium. So I think it's reasonable that it's a reasonable policy that the state would support the provision of children to their nearest school of that, of whichever those types they wish to attend. Okay, I'll move on for that. Uh, the 190 million, I think you said, was the cost uh, for 2007. Are we getting value for money at 190 million? And I want to speak about the surplus here. You know, okay, you said you won't have any surplus in 2019, I think, but you had it in 2015. The controller on his general report here. Uh, a surplus, that sounds like profit to me. Uh, and. Um, it's a crying shame if you have a surplus and a profit, and as I said, I'm going back to the same thing again. There's many, to, to a hundred, a couple of hundred children left out there, and there's stuff left over and couldn't be used to bring these children to school to care for them uh, uh, instead of having a surplus and, and uh, have a profit. It is a surplus a profit. Um, I'll, I'll take this first, deputy, Mr. Kent, if that's okay. Um, we, we have a transport management charge which, in in, in, is part of the is part of the, 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 the fees that we pay, the charge, the, the cost that we pay to Bus Aaron. But there's no there's no profit. Everything is assigned. There was a, a, a reserve held, which was held by Bus Aaron and referred to in their accounts in, in latter years, which was assignable on agreement by us to certain costs. And we made we made the call this year that we would uh, we wouldn't let them retain that in, in, anymore, and that has no longer been retained and won't be retained for them in tw by the end of 2018. So there's no, there was no profit in the scheme. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a scheme on the basis of cost recovery um, in terms of well, expenditure. Well, well bus they are rolling out the scheme, and uh, they're subcontracting a lot of buses, you know, for private individuals. Uh, are they profit? Are, are bus they are making a profit and running the scheme? Uh, and it's helping, and it's been said, I'm not saying it, I'm saying it, but it's been said that their uh, coffers are a lot richer because yeah. of the bus scheme and the uh, rollout of it. Right. And I want to go for a step further and ask, you know, it's, it's a monopoly when there's only one service provider, and that's bus they are. Uh, would we get value for the value for money if we opened it up to uh, contractors, uh, even private contractors? Because you are actually subcontracting from bus they haven't had the, con the major contract, but they are subcontracting in for the routes. Uh, the routes uh, are given out. I know plenty more around Kilkenny and Carlow and everywhere. Uh, would, we, would the government not get better value, the department not get better value if they just directly went to subcontracting and put it up to pretend on and um, see who uh, comes in at the best price? And would that not save us money at 190 million? Uh, you know, when you have a monopoly and when you have no one to, to compete against, it doesn't, to me it doesn't sound like good, good business. And this service level agreement that you're talking about, um, you know, it, it, even the controller rather general questioned that. He questioned about it, the service level agreement uh, in, when he's report up to 2015. Um, I'd be questioned now as well. And I always think myself, if, if we even got a, a sample of, uh, put it out, to a public auction there uh, to see who come in at the best prices, we might get a better service and maybe a cheaper service. And I just want to comment on that. Yeah. I'll take, can I take this first as well, if that's okay? And maybe Mr. Kent can come in. The, the department engages Buzz Aaron to, to basically look at the applicants, look at their routes, look at the tendering, and so on. So there's a, there's a whole transport infrastructure management expertise that Buzz Aaron has, and that's why we work with Buzz Aaron to do that. And within that, then, 
I think it's really important, nearly 83% of, of what they do is on the basis of procuring out. So 83% of the money we give to them, they procure out, and they do that efficiently, and they follow public procurement in doing that. They How do you know when you haven't anyone else compete for? No. The, how, how do you sorry, know uh, you couldn't get a better value if you were down? Because, if, if because you were down, just say uh, you, 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 uh, you put out to a private contract there to compete well, for, for, say, Kikenny, just Kikenny loan, you just put out a private contract to provide the service for uh, 12 months and then uh, let's put in and, and the private contractors or contractors go bid against it and see who can win the best value. Well, Bus Aaron aren't bidding to provide transport to Kilkenny. Bus Aaron are working out the routes and then procuring for services, majority externally for services. But could any from the private contract to do that as well? Uh, it would take a national organiser to do that on, on that basis and there's no alternative national organiser that we see and given that the bulk of what Bus Aaron do is outsourced in terms of the ex in terms of procuring which they procure to government procurement standards. So there's no question about the procurement I think by Bus Aaron of the of the services. I think the value for money question and I think that that was really helpful that that was confirmed by the, by the controller and auditor general. And we are we get updates and sign offs and reports from Bus Aaron to confirm that's the case. And we are looking at other ways that we can confirm that's the case. So I'm not sort of saying that we, we just take it on their word forever, but we have to look at it. But I I don't see an alternative national organizer to step in and organize all of those services um, and to to procure and to, to work it out. However, we are undertaking the audit of of routes and we we'll look to see when we look at the audit of routes which I referred to in my opening statement and moving from there we can then we can then uh, see if that informs any other policy choices. Of course there are policy choices but at the moment our very strong policy option is to work with Bus Aaron as the route provider provided that it's outsourcing the vast majority of the services as it does. So the private sector is hugely involved in school transport. I don't know, that's the point I'm trying to make. I mean, you're possibly not really run the system for a year. It was, could not the Department of Education run the system directly and put it out to, out to tender without the bus well, I mean, it's a, a second layer of, of bureaucracy we, we, uh, that could be avoided and uh, better value for money. I'm just a lay person yeah. asking these questions, but I know I'm a businessman as well, a farmer, and I know when I'm uh, trying to get a price, I always put it out to two or three people to see which is the best price and that's how I work my business and, and try to, to uh, get value for money. Yeah. I, I don't believe the department should provide to do the route work. I think there's, an, there's a transport expertise which is unique to Bus Aaron. There's route design, there's ticketing, there's a whole range of things that as a department we don't want to be involved with. We have, if you like, set up agencies to, to provide state examinations to do the work of the NCSE. We set up one on education welfare that's now with, uh, within Tusla and under the Department of Children. So these, I don't believe that the department itself should be undertaking that work. We, the, having Bus Aaron and Given the extent to which they outsource in the first place, it's the it's the transport management expertise that they have that I think that, 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 that's, that that's vital for us and very important for us. And what we have to do in value for money terms is ensure that we understand and all of the, the costs and, and, and are on top of all the costs that their accountants are signing off and that we are checking as appropriate and that's part of the service level agreement and so on that we've discussed and, and a, number, a number of other matters. Can I suppose they have to comment on that? Well, there's, there's two things, because you asked about value for money and that, so, and you asked about are we making a profit. Yeah. And the two things we want to say is 90% of the routes that we, put, that we operate are put out to tender. So they're put out completely in compliance with EU guidelines. They're procured, and, and, and anybody who gets to operate to them have won them on a competitive basis. So that's the first instance. And, and the second is that 83%, as you said, of all of the costs associated with the delivery of this scheme at the moment actually go back to the contractors. They're, they come through the department, they're passed through us, and they go out there, so that. What we end up doing from our perspective when you ask about it, this company has been through, as you probably know, Deppy, a radical transformation even in the last couple of years. And we continue to take on board a lot of the findings that we have. We, we have a transport management charge that tries to recover the indirect costs it's fallen almost every year. It's fallen from 11.2, and as part of the transformation that we tried to do again last year, because we've had to try and continue to, this year, it'll be of the order this year of about 10.5 million of costs. And that goes to cover everything for all of the indirect costs that, that surround the business and that's put in there. We try to deliver and utilize it and get as many double trips into the business as we can into every single route, and that's an important point. Mr. Kent, because just explain to people what, what you mean by a double route. Just 
a double trip. Like double trip. You, you, might, you might get the same bus to operate a, a run to the, the primary in the morning, but also to do the post-primary as well. So rather than... The so they, they, they do two runs in the morning and two runs in yes. the evening? Correct. Uh, rather than... Primary again, and secondary. Yeah. yeah. And that obviously, in certain instances, leads to you know, more capacity on the first bus, maybe and less on the second. Yeah. But from our experience, it's cheaper to still do that, better value to the state to do it, rather than be contracting two separate vehicles and different contractors to do it. So there's value delivered on that. Then, of course, that we continue to try and utilise the capacity. So even though, as you say, there's concessionary there, we do try to make sure that where we're taking it in, there's a contribution coming back into the value of the route, because, again, those, those, those students, again, are having to pay and to utilise it, and that contributes to the value of it. What we're doing more, as you say here, is value. we're never stopping. This is a, a new management team here again. We have a school uh, uh, transport officer just in place, and what we're undertaking again is a full structural review within our business of who's delivering it. And of course, we have delivered a lot of the services directly ourselves with our own bus air and fleet, bus over drivers over a number of years, supported by a lot of clerical administration staff. Now we're looking at the full needs of the scheme in conjunction with the department, particularly as, as, as we've recognised that as special education needs has grown, some of the assistance that we've had to do in that has to grow. But again, we haven't actually, you, you don't see that cost coming up. If anything, you're seeing everything that we're charging through the, what they call the school transport management charge, which, which is almost a misnomer in a sense because it's a recovery of all your indirect costs of providing the service. But that is coming down year on year and all since 2008. So to your point, I can categorically state that we operate this on a cost recovery. There is no profit at the moment in this for us, um, which is another matter for us, but that's within the scheme. So there's no cost, so we operate, we operate this, this scheme at the moment on a cost recovery, and where there have been surpluses from one year to the next, they're identified completely ring-fenced, and then brought where to the department. Does go? Does it go back to the taxpayer, or do you keep it? Back to the department, and at the department's discretion. Okay. Yeah, well, uh, uh, am I finished already? Yeah, time uh, plays. A whole lot. You might get back the second time. Uh, uh, and I just want to know about the control yeah. on the general, the 80 percent. Yeah, sorry, just, just split. Yeah. Back to the department. Yes, we have to return the surplus to the department if there's any surplus in, in any one time, and that's the way it operates. Mm -hmm. So the CNAG report did identify a surplus. It's gone back. But sometimes, as we said here, sometimes, depending on where you are, the scheme, that surplus has been used if the department agrees where we've ne either needed to invest in a technology system or where we've had to invest in more customer service support systems, and we just bring that to them and they decide whether we're allowed to do it or not. I have to stop quickly because I'm my train. That's a question. Uh, I to only, only comment, only comment. I want to clarify that, that the alternative, that's okay. But that surplus has been returned to the department, netted off this year for the first time. Previously it was held by Bus Aaron on, on an annual basis, but it, it's been netted off and returned to us for the first time this year. The, the, okay. only, the only comment I make, and again it's come back to what I said at the beginning, is that yeah, parents out there turn their hair out to get children to school, and there's a surplus left over that's handed back, and I think it should be utilised. That's really a personal thing, it should be utilised to look after the parents that are, are really in need of transport. Okay. I just want to go to the spare capacity that controlled on children, they're 80% in 2015, it was now 80%. Uh, that seems uh, spare. That means 20% capacity is there spare. Uh, that was 2015. What's the situation in 18 and, and 17 and 18? Uh, that sounds extraordinary to me that the spare capacity of 20% uh, left and not utilised and we have the situation that we have. That's according to control in general in 2015. Yeah. Who, am I, who am I speaking this to? You were... We can, yeah, you can do take that, um, I, I suppose just to, to qualify what uh, constitutes spare capacity, and um, both Stephen and the Secretary General have touched on it already, what we try and do is ensure that we get the maximum utilisation out of all the vehicles. So uh, in that case, we have 95% of bus air and vehicles that are operating more than one trip morning and evening, and we have over 60% of contractors. So what that means is that while their capacity may exist in one trip, um, you're actually still getting a more cost-effective network for the department and better value for money itself. Um, and I suppose just to, uh, to assure you that where um, capacity does exist in a particular route, 
it is fully utilised in terms of any demand that exists out there for concessionary transport. If there is demand for concessionary transport, any spare capacity or places that are available are actually um, allocated on that basis. And this year we have probably the highest number of concessionary um, pupils travelling because we're in the region of 28,400. Uh, so, as I said, we do aim to try and utilise the capacity as best we can, but we also have to look at the capacity in the context of the value for money that it provides and the actual utilisation we get out of the individual vehicles. I suppose one other point to touch on is that you're always going to have an element of spare capacity because if you have 35 eligible children presenting for travel, you have to procure a 50-seater vehicle. So, as I said, you are going to have cases out there where there's always going to be a certain element of spare capacity that exists anyway. But, you know, the key priority for us is to look at it in the context of the amount of utilisation we can get out of the vehicle, the cost that that would uh, incur to the state if we had to procure a separate vehicle. So they're actually looked in tandem, the two of them, the, the actual utilisation and the efficiency of the cost. Uh, Jim, Jim, just bring me to seat utilisation, and this is a survey that was done in, in Kilkenny as well by parents, uh, and I'm talking about what I call whoring of seats, and this is a big issue in... in, in, in uh, where I come from, rural Ireland or whatever, and these seats that are actually tickets allocated. I've got the answer several times from Post and forever, and it's for the seats being allocated uh, and then they're not being used and they're being hoarded. And they did a survey below on this same bus in, in Paulstown, I'm proud they're into Kilkenny, and they did a survey for a month after this year. This year, 11 seats were available every single day that they did the car. 11 seats, passing off seven children that were left to the side of the road. 11 seats were available. Going in and coming home. They did this. They did this survey themselves. Hmm. Hoarding of 11 seats that are not being used. I don't know parents may be going to work and bringing in their children, and it's only for the rainy day when they can't go, they use the seats. That is terrible. There should be something done about that, where you have seven children being passed off left on the side of the road, and 11 seats empty going off into, into and just saying, Pastor to Kilkenny. I'm just giving examples. I don't mean to mention my own area at all. Too. And I think that's a crying disgrace. It's a crying disgrace to see that 11 seats are there, seven children left on the side of the road, and going in and out, in and out. And they did it for a month. And it was an average 10, 11 seats every single day. And uh, I think Bus Aaron or the Department of Education should wake up and do something about this. If you don't utilise your seat should, uh, uh, within two weeks, three weeks, continuously, or maybe you have to make some uh, 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 allowances, but they should be taken off the field and not use them. And to just keep them for a rainy day that they can't go or something like that, or that the parents are not going to, I'm not saying what the situation, but maybe not going into Kilkenny for a work day or something like that, and then they use it that day. But to see 11, 11 seats available continuously for a whole month, never used, and seven children left on the side of the road. I think it's a disgrace and something <coughs> should be done about it. Okay, I no, I want to answer that. Uh, well, that's <laughs> I know he's going to tell me, going to tell me that the seats are located as they come first, and that's not the answer I want to. Uh, <laughs> I want to tell him that the seats should be utilised, well, that's what I want. I, I think there's a, the big, there's a big child safety issue here, and we, I, I fully accept we have a problem that children don't use the seats fully, but I'm not going to do a Ryanair job on school transport and over-allocate the seats and maybe have a child standing at the side of the road. It was not about over-allocating at all. He was saying, if it's a situation somebody has allocated a, a seat and a ticket, you have no method of knowing whether that's no. been used or not. And really, if you find after a full term it has never been used, that's, uh, that's it. Now, we're not suggesting you over-allocate, but we're just saying, if you had a system to get evidence of seats not being used... Okay. No, we're not talking about that at all. So, uh, have you looked at that, Trevor? We, we have it, and we haven't found a way to do that. I, different children use buses on different days rather than not using them at all. And that's the issue. So, that there's, yes, it's possible that there may be, but then we're into that child may not may be sick from school for a period of time. So, the amount of interaction required to manage that precisely gets very interventionist. This technology you're mentioning might solve it. But if you, you say you've looked at it, will you send us the note or the information, if you have looked at that, to, at least it'll help us understand how you teased out that issue. We know unless there's a way of checking in, in, the past going in, in, in modern you technology, won't know until you can do that. In yeah, modern technology, okay. even here, we come in here every day, we have to, we have to buzz in. So I think in modern technology, you can just simply turn in a bus, you press a button, I'm here every day, and I just want, I mean, so, modern technology. So, so I, I, I'm, go, I'm, I'm, I'm going on to the...
to remember children could be sick from school yeah. and, and there's a whole lot and that requires a high level of interaction with okay. the school. No, I'm going on to okay, Deputy uh, Connolly. Will, will I get back in again? No, you will. Uh, we come back to you. You have some documents because you've considered the issues involved. We know yeah. they're complex. You might give us a share with us the benefit of what you looked at. And look at, I know if every um, person going to school has to give their ticket, kids lose their school bags, not to mind lose their tickets. And I know it's always going to be hard to measure. But you, if you've looked at it, give us the evidence of the issues you've looked at. I have to go on to Deputy Connolly. You're very welcome, and thank you for all the information. And um, just first of all, I'd like to congratulate you. You're the first group that have come before us for Sarevan, where you've complied with all procurement rules. I, I don't think I've seen that before, so well done on that. I also realise you're not audited by the controller and auditor general, so thank you very much for your cooperation. Okay. And really, it's the department that are here today to talk about um, oversight of your scheme. Um, I think it's a great scheme. I certainly think there are operational difficulties on the ground. I'm going to leave them for the moment and look at what we're here for uh, in relation to it. And just maybe just two minutes before the finish, I want to ask a practical question in relation to Connemara. So you might tell okay. me. Yeah. So, um, having got that out of the way and the congratulations and the essential nat nature of the service, the report is quite damning, really, in relation to the department's oversight. And I realise things have moved on since then. So if we just go to these conclusions and we look at the conclusions, uh, serious flaws, even though ostensibly it's a cost-based service in your recovery of costs, he identified serious flaws, and particularly in relation to the management charge, which I'll come to. And then in relation to oversight, reporting requirements were weak, no service level agreement, forecasting, Poor, and he makes a number of recommendations, three really, and within those three there are a number. So for the department, in relation to the serious flaws, a cost recovery, and I understand what Bus Erden have said, but in relation to that then there was this management charge, and correct me if I'm wrong, 13%, it was fixed at 13% of the uh, direct costs, regardless. And then you capped that. And arising from that, year after year, there was a surplus. And then finally, we've accumulated service, which was 11.2 million when he did his report, and down to, was it 6 million last year? H how has that, now I think, it, I, and again, I might be wrong, the, Mr. McCarthy might correct me. I think his recommendation was to get rid of that, that there was no adequate explanation from the department in relation to it, how it was fixed and so on. So to get rid of it, I understand it's gone now. So my question. Where has it gone to? How did it happen? How was it? How was this? If it was a cost recovery basis, which is correct, how was this charge then allowed? And where has it gone to? And it's only gone this year. And I understand it's only gone really as a result of the special report. Is that right? It didn't come from any action from yourselves. Okay. Okay. Um, thanks, Deputy. Might just just start. start um, the question you asked about the bus errand and the CNAG, just the, the, the committee may not be aware, some members will be aware that four or five years ago we had a session about school transport and arising from that session we indicated that we would welcome the, the, the controller and auditor general going into bus errand to look if, if that was desirable. So just to say that was the, the genesis, if you like, of the report. Um, we. I think we really decided to have a very good look in the, in the last part of the last decade by a VFM on school transport and we concluded that we needed some rule changes uh, which obviously were adopted by, by government in relation to efficient routes which I you, you come from so I'm trying to explain the fixed charge I'm talking about and, and I'm going to come to that okay. now. Yeah, sorry. So, so, so we looked, and it also focused very much on the fixed charge, and we, we, got it, we, we had a detailed report on the fixed charge at that time as well. Yeah. We, we concluded that the best way to reduce the fixed charge was to cap it. Yeah. And it had previously operated, but when we, went three, when we moved away from the three for two seats, which was the situation that we had before, before we had a seat for every yeah. child, which meant that we didn't have spare capacity. But when we moved away from that, we... We, the, the extent of the charge meant that there was reserves building up for which, school for which Bus Aaron were able to purchase 
uh, with our agreement, they may have purchased buses with it on occasion. They purchased uh, computer equipment. They purchased, you know, they, they, they dealt with what they dealt with other ma matters. They improved their. Their, their, their mapping of routes and so on. They had no, HR I, no, management I'm systems. not questioning how it was yeah. used. So, so I, I accept that it was used yeah. probably for the good of, yeah. of the service. I'm not questioning that. It's now gone. And yeah. the, the, no. the, what was highlighted was it wasn't reported in the department statements, I understand, this surplus. Yeah. It, it, and it, it was the, the, the record, the, the yeah. paper record of it and the justification for it. We, um, <coughs> It, it, it arose from the arrangement that we had. We looked at that arrangement in the context of the VFM having gone for a seat for every child because the reserve was, 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 was building up. We agreed any allocation from it and we worked on the basis of allowing Bus Air to keep it year to year. But we had discussions both with, with internally and with the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform and we decided in, in parallel with the work of the CNAG we decided that we didn't wish them to retain it year to year, and that any cost such as that, we would um, any any cost such as that, we would fund them on an agreed basis in, in, in a year. So that's the basis on which we're going forward. We did we hadn't we it was public knowledge. We had talked about it openly, for example, at this committee. Yeah. We recorded it in our in our accounts in, in 2017, and it's in both area accounts as well. So has that direct man management charge gone now? No, no the, the, it's the it's the it's the keeping of a surplus on it. So, so we have we are we are looking at all the aspects of the. I suppose it's the it's there's there's direct costs which are paid for directly, and then in the management charge there's a mixture of some direct costs which we should just be paying for directly, which we're working through with Bus Air, and then some indirect apportioned costs. So it's a combination of those things. That, so that the 13 percent management charge is kept. It's still in existence. There, a, and what's a, gone a is the surplus. Yeah, there's a management charge which is yeah. well below 13 percent. Yeah. Okay. This is one area that's been the subject of many reviews. I looked at one review from 16 and it refers to 11 reports since 1977. And we have more reports, so it's, uh, it's been subject to huge analysis. But <coughs> in relation to the supervision by the department and no service level agreement, and I see your opening statement that there is a service level agreement and that's now under review. When did that service level agreement come into place? Um, the service level agreement came into place for the pre for the previous um, school year, so it was a service level agreement for 17-18, and we have one. We, we have we have extended and changed that for 18-19, but we want to improve it further. Okay, and again, why didn't that come in sooner? With with the, with the service of this nature covering so many pupils, a vital essential service with no service level agreement and the controller and auditor general's report, my time is limited, but he's itemised the lack of oversight and he specifies what should be in it. How did that not happen sooner? The issues that we covered in the service level agreement were covered in, in, the, in the interaction and regular meetings and annual, annual returns from Buzzerum, but they weren't caught in a comprehensive way in a service level agreement and it was fully appropriate to do that. But again, those operating me there were no minutes. Has that been rectified? Uh, absolutely. All of that's been rectified. Yeah. So, on the, the this quarterly meetings or monthly meetings? There's, there are mo mo mostly monthly meetings, most months, and then there's also quarterly meetings as part of that, uh, which are of, of a different kind. Okay. Just in relation to the spare capacity, and I understand. Honestly, I've read the reports, and I understand the balance. It, it's difficult. But. Um, the eligible students have gone down significantly from 2007, isn't that right? Well, overall, we're catering for 117,000 pupils per year, and of that, 85,000. What's the eligible percentage of that, the eligible students? Are concessionary. concessionary. Are concessionary, and the rest are eligible. And the concessionary pay a fee, depending on whether it's primary or secondary. Yeah. And you have this spare capacity, and that has increased significantly. Hasn't it? Since, well, apparently it has, according to the controller and auditor general. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe that's changed since his report. That the, the I think arises from the, the capacity doesn't take account of concern. So it's basically saying that the proportion of the of the capacity used by eligible students has, has obviously declined. No, I understand that, but the proportion. The, the, the number of eligible students has declined. The proportion of uh, concessionary students has gone up. Isn't that right? 
yeah. but the capacity on the bus has also increased the spare capacity. Is that correct? Uh, no. In the controller's report, the concessionary students weren't fully included in the capacity. Isn't that correct? No. The residual, I, I, the residual capacity. Yeah. The, there is a reference to residual capacity for the last two years. Each. Yeah, the, um, the estimated residual capacity we had in 2007 was 24%, increasing to 35%, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, taking into account the concessionary yeah. pupils. Uh, our, latest, our latest view would, would suggest that at the moment that it's riding at around 33%. 33% risk. Oh, that's 35 hmm? That's huge, isn't it? Well, well, of course we, we're trying to fill all the buses, but it's demand-led, and when we go out and procure services and we procure bus types out there, that sometimes you'll end up getting different vehicle types. So whether it's a 44 or a 52, sometimes it depends on where the market, where the locality is served. So of course, part and parcel of what it is at the moment is where, where there has been demand, particularly for concessionary, we'll try and make sure that every seat is occupied. And, and after that then, what we've also been trying to take into account is there's a very mixed nature in relation to the bus types that we use. So there's a combination of, yeah. um, you know, singles to 14-seaters to midterm no, to bigger that. buses. Yeah. So to a large extent, we try to deploy them as efficiently as we can every year. And remember, the issue that still continue, continues to confront us is that, you know, the closing day for this is, you know, around 27th of July. And you're trying to also get everything in place for the beginning of the school year in September, five to six weeks later. So until we know exactly where the demand emerges every year, you almost have to evaluate it on a year-to-year -year basis. Now, what we try to do then as well, to try and cater for that, and particularly for any mix or change in demand, is that we retender across the contract. So as I said, just 20% of all of the services retendered again to make sure you're getting efficiency and value. But then secondly, all of the routes then continue to be reviewed. And at this point as well, you know, we've, we've, we've made it very open that if there's any audit requirement uh, and any ways that anybody can see to improve mm -hmm. the efficiency and utilization of that, that we'll work with anybody that wants to review that with us as well. So we're com we'll be completely open and, and cooperative in relation to that. The, the, this, re yeah, thank you. this report in 16 recommended a reduction in fleet because of the residual capacity, isn't that right? The review of the concessionary charges. Yes. That hasn't happened. Yeah. 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 And, and in a sense, I understand that. I, come, I, I, I suppose where I'm coming from is I'm thinking of climate change and the necessity for buses on roads and the reduction of cars, that, so, which I haven't seen it mentioned anywhere in any of the documents. And in any value for money, it has to be a, a, one of the criteria taken into account, uh, climate change. Can I just uh, yeah. clarify, um, Deputy, again, I, I suppose the point I was making earlier in relation to spare capacity and, and utilisation are quite linked. Uh, you know, we try and get the maximum utilisation out of a vehicle, so where you may require a 50-seater vehicle to operate a post-primary trip with 44 uh, children, and that bus can do a primary run where there may only be 25 children on it, we will try and utilise that vehicle because it is far more cost effective. What it does, unfortunately, is it has an adverse effect on your, on your spare capacity numbers, but it has a greater level of efficiency and it's far more cost effective from a value for money and a department perspective. So I suppose, yes, when you look at the, the figures in isolation, um, you know, it, it is the multiple runs where the, the level of spare capacity is higher, where you have a vehicle doing a single run the levels of spare capacity are much lower, and that's that's as much. No, I, I understand that, and I understand the nuances of it, and yeah. I've read it, but I think there has to be some new imaginative way mm -hmm. of looking at this, I, and I hear that you're open to that, mm -hmm. but certainly in terms of climate change, we want more people using the buses. That's, that's essential. And then on the other hand, uh, am I near my time? No, it's a practical situation, for example, in Galway, and again, I, I want to make a general point about it, where um, children go into school and they have, they have the ticket, but they can't, if they go home at four o'clock or whatever the time is, they miss all the after schools um, activities. And they, they have written to us about this to say, look, could they use their ticket on the regular bus 
in this case it's Carraro going Golshir Goji Canther Nanilon, Carraro back to the islands. And those children have a choice of missing their school activities and going on the school bus or with your permission using that ticket to go on the regular bus that's passing back anyway and they can't. Am I making my point clear enough? Yeah. Unfortunately, it, it, it wouldn't only be our consent because you were talking about the scheduled services which are operated under the National Transport Authority. Yes. And they determine the fares for us, so they, they set the fare strategy in relation to those scheduled services. And we collect the revenue then in relation to how those fares are set. Yes. So, look, in an ideal world, I think we would all agree if we had an integrated ticket that might work on those services that would recognise revenue on that trip and revenue on that trip, Maybe that's something we can aspire to, but at the but, moment it's, yeah, not, it's not possible. But I think it's beyond aspiring to it, really. You know, we have major changes to make in terms of climate change. So I'm talking about one child, but it's reflective of quite a number of people. Actually, the person that wrote that letter said there was plus 20 students in that. So are we going to put 20 cars or jeeps on the road simply because we're waiting for an ideal um, time to come where we have a proper ticket? Deputy Collectman here, and I did talk about the balance between social policy and cost, but that is also an example of we would then be creating 20 empty seats a couple of days a week on a on track. So the, the, the children may choose not to take the school bus and may take a public bus and pay for it later. The issue isn't is the, there is actually a public service whether there's space on it. I don't know. The issue is whether the state should pay for the two seats the first seat on the school bus service and the second seat, or is it possible to rotate seats around so that then potentially somebody else can use the school bus seat? But that is very, very difficult to manage on a day-to-day -day basis. I understand, no, I understand the operational difficulties. We have no choice as a society yeah. but to face these practical problems in terms of climate change. So it makes no sense for 20 families to put jeeps and cars on the road so that their children can go to after schools activities when a half empty bus but they can still get on that bus deputy nothing is no, no they can't them. sorry in this particular case the school bus is gone no they can get on a public bus if there's a public bus it's just the issue of whether the state pays for them is the question ah uh, no that's that's been a bit well, no, disingenuous well, no, they, have, disingenuous they have paid. if you're saying that the alternative is for people to get in cars and drive them yes and there's a public service that's not been disingenuous. Well, the, the, the pub, there is a public, the way you've described it, there's a public service on that route. The but issue yeah, isn't, isn't whether, the, is whether they get on for, whether the state pays them to get onto that bus or not. My we near my two minutes. Yeah, yeah okay. Oh, oh. A minute. Just, there was one other, what did I come back to? Oh yes, the route review the independent, a number of reports were recommended in the chapter and you uh, said in your opening statement the route review was under. Yeah, we're, yeah. we're looking at three counties there, Deputy. We, we've done an initial digitalisation with Bus Aaron and we have a company engaged to look at that and that will look at the routes and look at, you know, the, the issues that we've been talking about. Actually, we'll look at all of the issues in terms of the, 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 whether the, the, the double tendering for the double route has been effective. The, all, all of those issues will be, will be undertaken. So, it's, if you like, it's an external challenge to bus Aaron's expertise on their transport management. And it'll be the first time we've done it. We're going to try trial it first in, in three counties, and depending on the outcome, we're considering taking it further. Okay. okay. And was that tendered for, or how did you get this? Is that an independent company? It was an independent company. Company doing yeah. that. Thanks. Right. Which three counties? And that's for us. Which Hank, have you? Galway, three counties. They're not fully, they're all together. Yeah, and the, the, the point is because... How do you mean they're all together? They're, they're contiguous. contiguous. They're beside each other, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. What about the but I think you're going to cover the point with that, yeah, because you will have some people from one county cover. Yes, about, exactly. Like, if you, yeah. that, that was going to be an obvious yeah. problem if you had stuck strictly Absol county by county. Yeah. So you're kind of covering the students from and one there, village going to yeah. the nearest one in the and next there's county. there's some urban and that's a lot of rural in, yeah. in so the areas. So there's a reason yeah. to close There is, yeah. Just, just, yeah. Chair, just finally, finally comment back to climate change because, I mean, we've no choice. I've, I've mentioned 11 reviews since 1977 and that's ignoring some of the other reviews. At some stage, and when we talk about a social responsibility in relation to this service, climate change has to be factored in into any of these reviews when we're looking at capacity, or, or it, it has to be a feature, and I don't hear it, um, Mr. O'Fowler. I, I talked about balancing costs with, with social policy. I, I, social policy includes policy in relation to climate change. We, we are responsible for, obviously, for school transport, climate change, and a broader transport 
responsibility is the responsibility of the Department of Transport and is taken into it's, account it's in a very large way no, it's in, in the planning framework. It's each department. But, it's across government. Yeah, but I'm, I'm, yeah. the, the policy responsibility for public transport okay. is with the Department of Transport and is taken account of in the development plan and Project 2040 in a very large way and has a huge regard to climate change. It's the time you'd be able to get back in. Deputy O'Brien. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions, uh, but I want to just follow up on the uh, management charge and the surpluses, uh, just so I can get it in my own head. We're saying we have the CNAG's report that 11.2 million was the accumulated surplus, uh, page 27 of the report. It's 11.2 million was the accumulated uh, closing balance surplus as per 2015. What is it currently? Because I know it went back to the department for the first time this year, I think. So how much went back to the department? 6.7 million. 6.7 million. 6 .7 million. Zero. So from 2015, when the closing balance surplus was 11.2, to no, which is 6.7, that's a decrease in the surplus. Do we know where that decrease was, or just if we can just get figures in relation to that? The reason I ask is in 2011 it was 8.1, and every year the close and balance surplus was increasing. We, we, the, the itemised expenditure, we, we can provide it to you, of Deputy, if you like, but I can talk through it. In 2017, there was expenditure on ESRI mapping and on the special education needs application system. In 2016, there was expenditure on fleet and an IT trapeze system, which was also expenditure in 2015. And there was expenditure in, on the trapeze system and some overtime in 2014. There were just, but we can itemise the expenditure. And can we provide it to the absolute committee? Okay. Yeah. So just in relation to the uh, surplus now, uh, a decision has been taken now that any unused surplus will go back to the department every year and it won't be held on account by bus airing, is yes, that correct? that's correct, I believe. Okay, so for the last number of years, the unused surplus was held by bus airing. Okay, and the, I presume there's interest accruing then and that it's held in a bank account somewhere and there's interest on it. That all is that included in the unused surplus or six point seven million at the end of last year would have been the surplus. Um, including the interest which has accrued over the last number of years. There, there was no interest accruing on it. Okay. So if, how do you mean there's no interest accruing on it? Because essentially um, the six point seven million was a balance, if you like, due back to the department held by Bus Aaron but we didn't make any formal calculation in relation to any interest that might or might not be payable on it. Okay, so just let me get this straight in my head now again. So every year there's a surplus, and in 2011 the surplus was 8.1 million. I presume it's held in a bank account somewhere, like it's, it's is it, or where is it held? Maybe the CNAG can help me out. Here. My understanding of it is that uh, it would be part of the cash flow in CIE, as opposed to that it was a, a separate uh, fund. It was identified separately and held by CIE, is our understanding, and that's the assurance we got from CIE and Bus Aaron. Okay, but if there's a surplus, like if I have a surplus at the end of the year of 8.9 million, I'm keeping it somewhere. Somewhere, it's not mine. It's it's a surplus, and I can use certain with the agreement to the department to offset some costs against that surplus if there's an agreement. But surely if I'm holding it somewhere, like I'm, I'm accruing interest on a figure of that, that amount, and maybe again the CNAG can help me in relation to this, it goes up every year. So we're saying that that figure doesn't include interest that would have accrued on it year on year. That's correct. No, it doesn't. The figure that stated does not include interest. Okay, where, where is, I mean, CNAG... Yeah. There, as I understand it, there was no agreement that monies would be held. There was no provision for interest to be charged on uh, any figure like that. These are the figures that just wash out of the, okay. the funding arrangement that was in place, and dating that, back to... Um, would uh, that be normal? I mean, 
Well, what you would uh, what you would certainly expect is uh, if, that if somebody is holding funds on behalf of uh, another agency, that there is a, a, a clear understanding of on what basis that funding is being held, and if there is. Um, uh, if you like, if the organisation that holds the funds is using the funds, that um, the, uh, an interest element would accrue, should accrue, but it's the responsibility, I think, of the department to ensure that if their funds are held, that they get the interest. So or there was no agreement in place in we relation didn't have an agreement. We, we had an agreement that they were holding it for usage on an agreed basis, and every usage of it was agreed. We didn't have an agreement in relation to interest. Is it possible to work out how much potential revenue in terms of interest accrued the state has actually lost through this agreement? It's You'd have to find a basis for agreeing what an interest rate would be in that situation. So, so interest rates are negative at the moment. Yeah. So, Would you be in an overdraft situation, CIE? No, we're cash positive. So, uh, so it wouldn't reduce an overdraft? No, uh, so uh, no we certainly okay. would be very low interest if that. Yeah. All right, that's interesting. Okay, just in relation to um, the running costs. Um, on page 54 of the CNAG's report, which is actually a copy of the old 1975 agreement, um, and again, I just, it's just for clarification in relation to some questions I have. Uh, it gives us a breakdown of... Let me just get up the page there now. It gives us a breakdown of what the running costs are, and it talks about um, the maintenance, the servicing, accident repairs, um, periodic overhauls, lubricants, tyres, fuels, etc., etc., etc. And it goes on. Then there's um, we know there's tax uh, paid on the buses. Is this just in relation to full-time vehicles that are being used? All the direct costs that are uh, here basically relate to the provision of the service directly, either through bus iron vehicles or through contractors. Okay, so let's take a contractor, okay? I mean, I would presume that that contractor, that's not his only use of his vehicle. He, he's free to use it for in other instances as well. So. Is, is this a correct statement that the tax is paid on that vehicle as part of the contract? Uh, we pay for the tyres, we pay for the servicing of the vehicle, um, but that is open to the contractor to use outside of the school. Well, no. Actually, the private contractor just provides the vehicle in full. Okay. So but the, those separate costs are the costs for the bus air and provision directly? That is the question. So it's just in relation to the service that is provided by bus air and the fleet. The fleet. Okay. Exactly. okay, that answers that. Just in relation to the um, EU Commission of Investigation into state, rule, state aid rules that was carried out, and they found that um, it was not compatible. Now, I know that we disagreed, and to be honest, I agree with that because I believe there is a social element to this. Um, but it says that the Department have been engaging with the Commission since 2014 about future implementation measures, and I was just wondering if you could give us an update on those engagements and where we are currently in relation to the EU Commission uh, finding that this scheme was not compatible with state aid rules. There are two two different EU cases, um, um, but they're they're linked. Uh, and the the updates, I suppose, on on the matter that we we have updated uh, the Commission in relation to, from from this department's point of view, the organisation of bus Aaron and indicated it's our it's our agreed intention at a at a stage in the future to ensure that the school transport element of bus Aaron is clearly identifiable within, within bus errands, that's one, one part of the update, and we're moving towards that, but there will be further changes to ensure that that is to take place. And the second update would be that there's a benchmarking exercise uh, being undertaken, uh, a methodology being developed uh, by bus Aaron in relation to the relative costs of, of, of bus Aaron uh, direct provision and private contractor 
uh, provision, which you were touching on in, yeah. your, in your previous question. Okay, and um, we don't, there's no penalties involved in relation to this. It's, it's, it's just an, an opinion. Um, there's there, no. We, at, I mean, while one can never be certain um, what, what an outcome will be, uh, it's our understanding that we're advancing in the direction of, of agreement on the outcome. Okay. But one, one can never be certain that that's the case. When, uh, when do we hope to reach a conclusion in relation to those negotiations or those engagements? Um, uh, there isn't a definitive timetable. Okay. I think it's. I think we, we, we keep them updated on the developments, and then they come to a conclusion. But there's no with 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 these EU, with these EU cases. I'm I'm not aware of a definitive timetable. Okay, and um, I just want to go back to the surplus again, if I can, for one moment. The uh, 3.10 of the CNAG's report on page 27 states that the surplus of 11.3 million was rounded up in sums to a category described as a property charge. The first question is, what is the property charge? Um, and the second one is that furthermore, non-reconcurrent uh, charges applied by Boss Aaron against the unused surplus and which were accepted by the department uh, were three million for future pensions for school bus drivers. That's explanatory enough. Um, and 3.4 million as a contribution to capital investment. Are we able, like 3.4 million contribution to capital investment, I presume that's purchasing of new vehicles and... Uh, that's actually in relation to operational um, systems. The operational for, systems? Yeah, for planning and scheduling services. Okay. And what was the total cost of that? 2.6 million, maybe, with, and then some other technological pieces on top. Is it possible to get a breakdown of that 3.4 million? Absolutely. Okay, and you can just provide it to the Absolutely, committee. Yeah. Or sure. the breakdown, I think we've committed to already. Yeah. Okay, that would be part of that. I, I, I okay. Thought, yeah. So uh, the last question just is, uh, can you explain what the property charge is? Um, and you can just... Absolutely, yeah. So the property charge basically is all of the properties that the schools, either vehicles or staff, are sitting within. Basically, there's an opportunity cost, if you like, of basically a rental foregone for using those buildings. So it's essentially calculated at a rate that was agreed. Okay, just, um, just start again there now. I'm sorry. So basically, if you look across the whole bus air and infrastructure, basically, you have three different businesses. You've got what we call the PSO services, the expressway services, and the school services. Okay. We're across a wide range of properties across Ireland. And what was done was looking at each of those properties and based on space, and based on space used either in the yard or in the maintenance or in the offices related to schools, there was a split done, basically, and a, char a charge was, a group, let's say, put out there, basically, that related to if these were to be rented on the open market, how much um, bus air or, if you like, CIE would, would get. So that's what the property charge is. All right, so you say there's a bus depot, and if yeah. I'm wrong now, just tell me I'm wrong, because I'm, I'm just trying to understand. If, 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 if there's a bus depot, yeah. and there's two school buses using part of that depot, are we saying that there's a property charge then applied to the department on the basis that if there weren't school buses and you are renting them out on the open market, you may get more? So if you take, take, take the analogy, if you had two school buses and if yeah. you had two... Um, let's say, non-schools buses, and if they were both occupying equal space in the yard, then basically 50% of that um, space, basically, at a rate, would be charged to the Department of Education. Okay. And then if you had to take the same analogy, if you had people in an office, based on, again, the square foot that people are occupying, some people are schools, some people, because we've got three different businesses within the bus area, we would look at the space that's occupied related to the people that are okay. What was the, the property schools. charge for 217? It's, uh, what was 1.3 million. So for 211, 212, 213, 214, it was 2.5 million. For 216 and 17, it's, oh, sorry, for 215, 16 and 17, it's 1.3 million. Is that correct? Yes. So it went down by 50%, more or less. Um, how do we explain it went down by that much? I mean, I presume... The bus, the fleet hasn't gone down by 50%. That's gone down by quite, quite a lot. I'd have to get the exact figures, basically. But I think we had about 650 buses going back. And now we've got just about 400-odd. Okay. So it's certainly gone down by, by a good chunk. And, and then... The EFM 
of reducing somewhat the uh, bus air and fleet, and that has been reduced, and the proportion that's outsourced to contractors through procurement has increased significantly. And uh, that's a matter of dialogue for us about, about what with bus air and about what, what the right level would be. We obviously, as you've noted already, Deputy, on a couple of occasions have, have supported the purchase of buses by bus air as well. And Mr McCarthy, with is that explanation satisfactory for yourself? Well, I think what drew our attention to the, the figure was that it was a very round figure. So um, it, it's really, um, if you like, a notional figure. Obviously, it has some uh, bearing in reality. Buses have to be parked somewhere. There has to be security um, and, and so on. But um, when we asked for an explanation of well, wh why is it precisely two, uh, two and a half million, we didn't get a detailed uh, explanation for it. Um, okay. And I, I think the, uh, the, the dropping of the figure, again, it goes back to the work that has been done over the years, looking at how do we arrive at these figures and how do we know that we're recovering the costs incurred. Mm -hmm. There is an element of um, uh, guesstimation or apportionment uh, going on there. And, and all of that has to be, to get has a to be breakdown. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't get a breakdown of the two and a half million. Uh, why was that? It just wasn't forthcoming, or was the information is it, not it available? It didn't appear to be available. So the information is not available. I mean, surely if you're charging 2.3 million in a property charge, you have a breakdown in well, relation. Just on that point, I know that there has been an exchange with us on the department at one point, and just one of the notes that we did provide to the department at the moment is under our estimation that we, we, had, we had allocated information for offices and depots of approximately 84,000 square metres when we were asked to do that. So that, I guess, is again that you again would pick up as part of your annual reviews to say how much is being utilised depending on how many staff are in different locations. So we're operating across, we have staff and clerical play in across 16 locations across Ireland. We operate the depots around through 11 depots throughout Ireland. And depending on how many fleet and how many people are in different places, we try to continually review on that and say, okay. is that reasonable? So, you know, as you would say here, it's probably a reasonable number as opposed to maybe something that's scientifically apportioned. And that's, I think, the way we've got to it. It's a reasonable number that was developed in conjunction with the department. My time is up, but it's something I might come back to. Yeah, if I, just, I, mean, I, I, I think this is a very important line of, of interrogation. And it, we, part of... Question. Well, yeah, sorry. Question. I, I, didn't, I don't sorry. interrogate anyone. <laughs> I, I, I meant. I, I, apologies. But the, interroga the interrogation <laughs> is coming next. Right. Trust I mean, me. Uh, to be fair, I meant interrogation of the figures. I wasn't at all implying you. Right. Uh, and, but that this, we have had our independent, a, fur a further independent report on the management charge, and this is, this is an example of part of the issues where, as part of our detailed work with Bus Aaron, and the chief executive has just referred to an example of the information flows, that we will be seeking to satisfy ourselves to an increase. That's the FGS report, or was that just the one on the methodology? We had an RSM report on which was which we got completed oh, in yeah. March of this year, okay. which was a follow-up on the FGS report, and it has identified this issue, and we will be. Uh, it has, has identified this. The this FGS sort of report. None of the recommendations were implemented, if I'm correct. Well, the FGS report highlighted to us, I think, the. The, the level of particularly the management charge, and we prioritised reducing the management charge, okay. as, as, and we have succeeded in doing that with the agreement of both areas. Okay. I'll, I'll come back in for a second round of question, and the interrogation is starting now. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, uh, as I've been monitoring it on the, on, on the monitor in the office, I, I may have missed some stuff, so if any of these questions have been dealt with, just tell me, Chairman, and, and we'll yeah. move on and I can consult the record. Um, is any of the, the transport outsourced, or, or do Bus Aaron do it all? Is, is for you know, their income is outsourced to contractors. Okay, and uh, so that's high, isn't it? Yeah. Um, it, does that incur any additional cost to the state? The fact that it's outsourced is there any? Yes. Um, part of the trans part the, the tendering, the safety checks. Or, or the inspections, those are all extra court with charge their cost to the state as a result of it being provided. But if it was provided by Bus Aaron directly, the safety there would still be safety costs, there would still be inspection yeah. costs. And is but it because we don't have the fleet 
No, it's a policy call to, to outsource. It's a policy call? Yeah, it's a policy and, call. And, and what's the benefit? Um, I think we, we, we want to have as much of the school transport provision tendered for by Bus Aaron to, as possible with, this, with a reserve within Bus Aaron. And we, we feel that the, the best value for money is by Bus Aaron procuring externally. It would be a different matter if Bus Aaron was to provide all of the provision themselves. That would be a, a different nature of our, an arrangement, and that's not the arrangement we seek to have. And would that be cheaper? Um, I'm not sure whether I, I don't. I don't believe it would be cheaper. I think we're ensuring we get value for money. And by the CNG, have you I've been looked outsourced. at that? Well, I, I haven't taken a view on it. I, I think there has been um, a value for money uh, examination um, undertaken mm. of the, the service on the basis of the way it's currently um, organised. I don't think it looked at the issue of whether it should be contracted out or, or done as a, a direct service by uh, Bus Air. I, I suppose the, the, uh, certainly the question that arises uh, with Bus Air, it is the service provider of last resort, and if you like, having that underpinning of um, a, a contracted out service. That uh, must really build morale in Bus Air. Sorry? That must really build morale in Bus Air. Well, I, I, I think the, um, the service provider you, of last resort. No, but but to, <laughs> if if you uh, recognise that, let's say, um, you know, a small contractor may not be able to fulfil the service. Yeah. Um, I, I think it is for a public service body. But it just to was say that we, to we will be there if you know if the uh, the, the person we've contracted out to uh, isn't there to fulfil the service. It just uh, would stand the reason to me of, that if a company with scale mm. could deliver the service over the whole country. Uh, then, uh, a company of scale, though. That's a, a, a company. Well, I, I would have thought Bus Air were a company of scale. Sorry, deputy, can I just take up on you that yeah. as well? You know, I suppose what we look at is the requirements of the scheme too. And Bus Air operate primarily large vehicles, and you know there is a requirement out there with the evolving needs within various locations to have a mix available of, of smaller vehicles either because it may be the suitability of the, yeah. uh, of the roads themselves or actually the, the level of demand. But there might be nothing to stop us so, doing that know, if we chose no, to do that. Yeah, but I suppose what, I, what it offers at the moment is the flexibility to, to procure vehicles of different sizes as well yeah. out there in the market. And, and, and that leads me to the next question, really. I, mean, I think it's something that we should look at, uh, because if you are dealing with one operator, there's only, I suppose, one... one um, set of management to deal with, one set of vehicles to deal with, one uh, maintenance strategy, health and safety strategy and so on, rather than tendering each time and going in to see this Mark McCherry, the bus operator in Sligo, have everything he needs from a safety and organisation thing. And I think that while there would be certainly initial capital cost in making sure the fleet was appropriate to the demand, uh, it may be uh, uh, something that would be worthy of examination. So if I could just suggest that. So is it safe to say then that really the scheme is designed totally based on demand? So it's, it's kind of, we'll see what's looked for next year and then we'll put a series of tenders together that's going to deliver for those children? Or No, it's, ba it's based, I think, on incremental change. Obviously the scheme is based on demand, but the, the amount of change year to year is still minimal. Yeah. And Boss Aaron have a policy of tendering for routes at least once every five years as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking um, where well, we have kind of capacity issues in larger cities now and we have a housing crisis and we have, we, we have all of those and really it's replicated, relatively speaking, in, 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 in any kind of urban centres around the country that uh, then equally, and you'll know from PQs and reps that we have to make to you or whatever about the, the smaller schools under pressure, uh, and then, of course, every year, the child whose brother is the p place on the school bus, but he can't get it because we have a new way of measuring the route to the school or it's the closest school or whatever. Has there been any cross-departmental analysis of how, bearing in mind the difficulties we have in many urban centres, and here in Dublin there's always pressure to build new schools, and I know we have two new ones in Carroll's Cross, that we would examine the introduction of a more proactive transport scheme to try and encourage... Uh, I suppose the, the repopulation of rural schools, uh, which might be of assistance in terms of housing and pressures in many of the urban centres, um, and, 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 and using transport as a tool to do that, to say, look, school X is in a rural area, but, but we would, you know, the facility is there, the infrastructure is there, and we'd like to build it back up to 
um, you know, a, a, a viable level of students, which in turn then make, take some pressure off the, the, the urban difficulties that we're having in abundance throughout the country. Has there any analysis been done like that? And would there be an aversion, as I'm, <coughs> because I'm guessing there possibly hasn't, with all the other pressures on the departments, that we would look at something like that? As a policy, we've based it on providing children on, in, the, in, in general with transport, eligibility for transport to their nearest school subject distance criteria, rather than population move, if you like, rather yeah. than trying to bring people out of... Well, out could, of I, could, could I suggest, and I appreciate this would be multi-departmental in terms of analysis, but I think it would be useful, and whether it's housing, whether it's environment, whether it's transport and education, uh, that we could do worse uh, than have a discussion about it to see if we could take a proactive approach. We clearly have a number of rural schools all over the country that are under pressure and from a political perspective any councillor or TD or senator will be able to verify uh, that that's the case and yet we have pressures every, you know, in so many other issues, not least school places, housing and so on. Could it be something that we look at? So I most respectfully ask okay. that at the cross-departmental forums that you can, have can with I, fellow Secretary-Generals... Can, yeah, can I mention two things then, Deputy, in response? Yeah. First, I, I can recall a case of a school where it was in the West where the patron had decided to close the school, a second-level school, and we in the department did an analysis having regard to school transport costs, and notwithstanding that the school had 250 pupils or so as a second-level school, we calculated that it was, it was more cost-efficient and, and benefiting the local community to leave a second level school in the town and that <coughs> it was a Catholic patron at second level and they transferred the patronage to the local VEC as it was at the time so work like that can be done but on a, on a very high level we have Project Ireland 2040 we have economic targets to develop populations in, in the regions in scale and there is a lot, I'm on the Project 2040 board, delivery board, there is a lot of work being done in terms of bringing together their perspectives from the different departments to enable economic growth, in, including houses and jobs, and obviously education infrastructure linked to that in the regions. So, so there is at a high level an a, a serious policy to, so seek to, to seek to have diversity of economic growth and capital investment from the state to support that. So is that a... Yes, we look at that. No, yes, it's, that, that, that is being looked at. Okay, your, well your particular, your partic good. what I've right. what I've said out is policy of, of the government. I'd, we'll we'll consider obviously the suggestion that, that you've made. We'll have we'll have a look. We'll, if we'll you have could, because you see, on the other side of it is then, and it's not my constituency. Well, it actually is. Uh, won't be the next time. Um, the, 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 we're closing a school in Bon Boy in Cavan, and and and. and moving it in with another school in a larger town, I think, in Ballyconnell or El Turbot or somewhere. So again, I, I, I just wonder about the wisdom of these policies when we're having, on the other side of the policy house, you know, serious difficulties and, and will have into the future because of uh, um, the urban pressures that are there. Um, just one thing that, that jarred with me there in terms of the, the, the closest school and all of this, and, 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 and while it's not the, the particular query that's making me raise it is, it, it, is a grant aid one that has arisen in, 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 in education. Um, the distance from, you know, your house to the school or your house to the university, or, or, is Google Earth now the standard that there are Google Maps now the standard that, that, that the state or the department embrace as the benchmark? Could I ask? Was there to answer just how, the, how you do the measurements? Is that okay? Yeah, we use Google Maps. Yeah. yeah. We're using Google, yeah. It, it is a mapping system that we use, and we map from oh. the... Um, is, it, is, is it Google Maps? Yes. That's yeah. what we use. Yeah. And, we, and what about when there's evidence then, when somebody who's driving it every day says to you, look, Google Maps is wrong? Well, the rules say that it needs to be traversable. So if it is, and there's something oh, that happens, it means that you must, be able to, you must be able to drive it. Yeah. I, I so, but, but if you can way. drive it, and the mileage is less, because I, I've come across Google Earth or Google Maps not being accurate. Yeah. And I mean, one particular grant scheme yeah. for one particular client, I won't go into the, but, the, the personal case, but yeah. uh, I've toed and froed, just, just and, and I've been told, oh no, well, Google Maps said it, so it's true. Yeah. I mean, but God, we, I'd, I'd hate us to be using Google as the benchmark yeah. for... 
We don't. We, we use the tool to map and to do it. But on top of that, then we have supervisors that are out on the ground, so they actually still have to undertake a safety check. They still have to look yeah. and see if the route is manageable. So, but my experience is that's not happening. My experience is in writing is Google Maps says therefore that's the position. You know. But th there is an independent appeals process there, Deputy. If there is, if there is a query. And the other end, it's, you know, Google Maps is correct, but it's not. But that is available, as I said. I know, but we have, we have an Ordnance Survey Department in Ireland. And uh, uh, from my first year geography class, I know how to take out a piece of thread and me measure the distance. I don't need Google Maps. You know, and I think that, you know, what are Ordnance Survey Ireland doing if we're not using them as our benchmark? Google, I mean, God knows you can Google anything and get any answer you want. So I would just suggest that this is uh, uh, we, we, a, a, a poor practice to depend on Google Maps as the benchmark from the distance from A to B as a reason to refuse somebody a grant right. when, when the practical reality on the ground, and I don't believe, frankly, a supervisor is getting into a car and driving from Sean Fleming's door to Mark McSharry's door and saying, that's the distance. Yep, de deputy, it, does that not happen? Like, I thought the guys go out and measure the route and they have the equivalent of a taxi meter or equivalent technology to measure the distance to the nearest meter. In uh, supplementary cases where required, where someone does contest a measurement, we will use that as a backup or we may be asked by the department. He is. Explain that system. <coughs> What I've said is where there is uh, somebody contesting um, a measurement in particular, we do have a backup facility where a supervisor will travel a route and just verify the measurement. And as I said, we would frequently be asked to provide that backup to the department um, on occasion. You know, we are, these are all the areas I suppose we're looking at, at, at developing. We're, we're doing work with um, ESRI maps in terms of all our route mapping also now, and we're looking at trying to develop air codes into the system. And I suppose we're continually looking at ways to try and make it more... Those two are not accurate. If you put the air code into your sat nav and head off, you won't be at the door. Yeah. You'll be on the block, maybe. I suppose what we have to try and make sure is that we're measuring, you know, every case on a consistent basis. So yeah. if it is I an might, air code, I might write to you from a parent on the specific it. case and just see if you can take a look at it. Um, just, yeah. And what's the technology in the car? Is that the guy just put his minometer? They have equipment in the car. Backup equipment. Oh, what, explain what is this because it is I, the equivalent I, of a taxi meter. At that yeah, well, explain that because I'm a, I'm trying to. Oh, I should explain. You tell us because I know when we checked them out, the guy said my system is more accurate than that. It's down to the meter. Yeah. As in not the meter, the meter distance. He said this is a hundred percent accurate. Yeah. My measurement and there is no, and there must be a record of that. And, the reason. So we, and we would send out. Technology or what we is would it? send the. It is the equivalent of of a, of a taxi meter that's used as backup, and we would send that, you know, print off to the department um, to verify the distance where we're requested to do so. Right. And how many of them would you have? How many inspectors have them? We well, we have 36 inspectors nationwide, um, well, and we would use. No, no, they wouldn't all have them. We would try and have maybe one in each location that that would be available for. So in use. the contentious cases, yeah, they send yeah, out this guy yeah, yeah. or a woman at the gate. That's all I'm trying to establish. Okay. Um, so I've just been corrected, so I, I apologise because we do something else with Google Maps. But I'm, I'm, I've been a note here to say that we do base it on the Ordnance Survey maps and road network data. So that's the system that provides it. Mm. So we've other work to be doing. We should probably stop giving it as, a, as an answer in official refusals then. I've just corrected the record there anyway. Just you know, anyway, so that's uh, I'll, I'll write to the Secretary about the individual case anyway. Um, <clears throat> is the school transport the, the only transport in Ireland that, that doesn't have a service level agreement? Well, Deputy, as it happened, we have a service level agreement. Deputy, I want to make a statement here. The press release that went out from the committee yesterday yeah. said there wasn't a service level agreement. Yeah. I've been corrected this morning. There wasn't at the time of the report. I think. Well, there is now. Good news. Yeah. That's recently, great. Yeah. Okay, I move on. Well, and I accept that we put it in place for the 17-18 school year first, which is last, the last school year. Progress. doesn't matter. Are any other public transport services under the control of any department other than the Department of Transport. Who wants to take this? I'm not aware that we have any public tra other public transport services under our aegis that I can think of. Transport to the islands. I, there's a, there's, I mean, that, that's a, 
part of the Gale talk to us. Aviation. The school bus transport. Today. I know that, but I mean, uh, like, uh, you know, I'm not asking yeah. for the answer in Chinese, know? like. I'm only, I'm only from our department's point of view. I'm only aware of the school transport system that I can think of. Yeah, Obviously, no, uh, individual schools can do. Is there somebody here from the Department of Transport? Yeah. Um, yeah so of Transport. Anyway, my understanding is that you're not responsible for the aviation to the islands, so Tory Island, Iron Island. Um, and I'm just asking, why isn't it your department, and should it not be? Yeah, the the department. Yeah, the department. Um, we deal with public transport systems generally um, and uh, throughout the country. Specifically in relation to the islands, it is a matter that's led by the Department of Regional... Sorry, I can't recall the name of the department. The department that has responsibility for islands... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. Rural Affairs in the Gaeltic. Pardon. Yeah. Uh, that that department uh, leads in that particular area rather than our own. But in terms of the principle of subsidiarity and your expertise, obviously, in transport and aviation included in that, would it not be better in your department? Well, I suppose the allocation of functions between different departments is a matter for the Taoiseach to decide on how he allocates them between so if ministers. We wanted, so if it we, would follow <coughs> on from that, is, is my understanding. If we wanted to, to, as a committee to see that under your remit, we should approach the Taoiseach then? Well, um, to answer the deputy's question, I, I suppose the question is um, hypothetically as to whether a function should be realigned from another department to our department. What our department deals with is public transport services mm. on road and rail, and we deal with that through a range of agencies. I suppose the services to the islands are probably more specialised and they have a very particular community sense to them and therefore it's the department that leads around those areas. The decision has been that their, um, their understanding and their expertise around community issues and decisions is probably the more, um, the more uh, significant issue that determines how it has been decided to make that allocation. Good answer. I respectfully disagree. So, as a committee, That's I think we should be asking uh, <laughs> we ask in the Department of the Taoiseach, um, because I know they're not overrun with avionics engineers in the Department of Rural Affairs that may be able to come under transport. I'm nearly there. Yeah. Uh, many legal cases have been taken or are before the you know, bus air in terms of the, the you know, taken by children or accidents or no. issues. Or, well, there's no legal case that we're aware of with the Department of Education and School Transport. Okay, and if, 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 if it, on, on, God forbid, the if there was, a, if there was an accident or a, a child there, flipped what? or anything like that, who would be? Well, it would, I mean, I think, I said with the Department it's possible there could be a case of bus air. It would be bus air, wouldn't it? Yeah, I, I don't have that information, so I'd have to furnish that for you. This is for us to know uh, and then to see, I suppose, the costs, legal costs associated with them. Uh, do you handle them yourselves in terms of uh, a legal firm? Does it go to the state claims agency? You know, what's the situation uh, there? And just very finally, well, and you a request now from you the commission could, to send. If you could send that into us, like for, topic, for, for us to consider. I can just ask the CNAG. The, uh, CNAG, you, you, you obviously don't audit Bus Erin. That's correct. Um, uh, to, uh, would that be, and um, while well, I appreciate it's not up to you to decide who you audit, it's up to probably the Taoiseach or whatever, but uh, um, would it be better if you did in the context of providing oversight to this area? Um, it's a very different type of organisation to most that we uh, yeah. do audit. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I think there, there's probably a policy angle to it as well in that um, there are other... Um, service companies, uh, ESB and Board Gosh and so on, that we don't audit also. They uh, have um, a customer charging uh, regime similarly uh, mm -hmm. with, with CIE. So, I, I mean, it's not, uh, I'm not looking for extra work. Oh, no, I know you're not looking for extra work, and indeed you have enough, but uh, I, I'm just wondering, in terms of the, uh, you being able to provide the picture to us that we need, and because of the commercial mandate of, of bus air and, and semi-state and all of that kind of stuff, is it, I, I, 
are you in a position to give us the kind of picture that we want, do you feel, given the fact that half of the equation is, is department and policy that you do uh, audit, and, and, and obviously a very significant part of it is not? Well, I mean, I, I would obviously try to um, give you the assurance you need around the expenditure, let's say, by the Department of Transport, to the extent that they're making payments uh, my focus would be on ensuring that they have um, systems in place that allow them to give the assurance. Uh, and and uh, to a certain extent, that's what we're doing with the school transport uh, special report. Yeah, and again to yourself, the, uh, I'm told that the accounting arrangements between Bus Aaron and the Department of Transport are in place since 1975. That that's correct. Updated. Yes. Mm. So what are the Im implications of that? I mean, obviously I'm not up to date, but international accounting standards, but what are the implications of that, or are there any, from your own perspective? Does it need to be updated? Are there systems that have moved on that were behind the curve in, or anything like that? Well, I, I feel certainly that in terms of um, a, a good understanding of the cost base uh, for the provision of the, the service, that the 1975 agreement was out of date. Okay. Uh, there were certain aspects of it that um, let's say, for instance, the 13% uh, add-on for uh, the, the management cost. We, we never got an explanation of why 13% was ever appropriate in 1975. And part of the um, uh, recommendation there was that there needs to be a better understanding of what makes up that charge. Why should it be what it is? Uh, and so on. I, I think there has been work done. Um, over the past number of years to try and get a better fix on uh, what the, the costs are. Um, okay. But it, it, it's, um, it was certainly something we noted that the assurance that was being given on the account that is produced under the 1975 agreement was an assurance that the account was produced in the manner that was required under the 1975 agreement. It wasn't an assurance that this is an account of the cost of the service. And I think that's what the department is moving towards. Okay, so there's a review underway. Is that reasonable to say? We've put in place quite a number of measures, which, which we mentioned already, and most importantly, the service level agreement and the financial updates and the key performance indicators as part of that. But equally, we have the, the review of routes in the three counties, and we will be seeking, exploring the possibility of updating the, account, the accounting relationship as well as part, of, as part of our work and getting information flows on all aspects of the costs, uh, some direct and some indirect. Okay, great. Happy Christmas. Thank Just you. A few quick questions before Deputy Aylward comes in. Are all the drivers guard vetted? Yes. 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 And the contractors drivers? Yes. Yes. And the escorts? Yes. yes. Yeah, no, just ask the question. Um, that, that's fine. And that, does that complicate things during the summer? New drivers, change of drivers, in addition for us? It, it particularly complicates on the special needs scheme with, yeah, with that, escorts, escorts and, and taxis. And that's the question yeah, I'm especially. asking. Yeah, especially. Yeah. So and it, and it, if a parent is the escort, does the parent have to be guarded better to mind their own child? Yes, as far as we know, yeah. <laughs> That says a lot. Okay. Yeah, there could there could be other children. There might be other. I the understand that so too. Okay, yeah. but there is guard of vetting, and I know that. It goes back to the first thing. You leave it very late in the year to close the applications. I know that to give people time, and they need to be, and it causes an awful problem in a very short six or eight week period. Why why do you leave it so late? Why don't you a month earlier? You know, in June. Well, we've tried to close them in April, and it doesn't work. Well, no, there's a big jump from when you're closing date now. We clo the closing date is April for applications yeah. and July for payments. For the check. But I'll be honest with you, Chair, the real difficulty we have is that we, the, the closing dates aren't really observed. By whom? And by, by you? No, by, by, by applicants. The public. And, and, and people maybe uh, supporting their application, <laughs> let's say. If the price will be left off the post, that's right. Well, yeah, well, and let's, and let's, so we, we need to move them, we, move, we need to move to a better... Can, can, on, they apply online online system. can they apply online? Yeah. So we need, yeah, we yeah, need yeah. I mean, this isn't like the CAO. Yeah. Okay, if, if it, we need to move it to be understood to be like that. Yeah. You, but, but I would not say that that's for general application. People, we have to accept that people with special education needs are, are different and the, the, the children with special education needs, the needs can arise at short notice at any time. Okay. And this is for the general. So that's part, part of one of the things we're looking at has been 
more more harsh on that application. Also, more generally on admissions bill, admissions act yeah. to schools, we we've, we're regulating more around entrance to schools and so yeah. on as well, and application for entrance to schools. Right. Okay. Um, just another question: the CIE on vehicles. What happens them during the holiday period? Are many of them with the yellow school bus? Symbols still on them. Are there many of them out there still? Uh, well, they're maintained during the summer, so for the period they're, they're in not use. used. Oh. That's not good for you. Like the, the private contractors get to use the buses 52 <coughs> weeks yeah. of the year. Yeah. And um, my question is, how many of the yellow buses, bus colour or whatever you have written on them, have you bought the last five or ten year, ten year, decade? Uh, Twenty. Twenty. So you're, you're buying very few. Very few at the minute. Yes. Yeah. Fine. There's been a cascading as well. Pardon? There has been a cascading as well, which, oh, is, which isn't underway anymore, I'm older, do you want to? to take, to take the that might have been bought um, traditionally through CIE and into now more laterally by the NTA and that you could, there was an opportunity for the state to be able to cascade vehicles that reached a certain age and you'd, you'd take them into school bus activity. So the oldest ones go for the kids? Well, they, yeah. they would have a life of time and you were trying to put them back out again where they may not be as, as suitable for and what's happened in the more recent years and the reason back to the point where we haven't got it is now as, we're, as, the, as, as the NTA continue to replenish fleet in the PSO side of our house yeah. typically you're, you're buying double decks or a different type of vehicle that may not be suitable for country roads or on the alternative like for our expressway vehicles they're bigger coaches, 64-seater, and again, inappropriate for this so Where is this issue going then with these old but are they all? Is it only a matter of a few years before there's <coughs> none of them left? Well, it's something now that we're entering into dialogue, and it's certainly very, very, very soon right now in relation to our needs for the scheme for a direct... So how many of them have you on the road? We'd have, uh, we'd have about 420 buses that we service directly with our own drivers. And they all have delivery, the school bus delivery on it? They would be, they would be, yeah, they're older vehicles, but they are bus air and why, designated aside vehicles. from delivery, if you change that, why couldn't you use those buses for the other 30 weeks of the year? Like, it makes no sense to us to have buses locked up for... Look, a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of the PSO buses, they're fitted out depending on the standards, so depending on what's in there. So the NTA uh, are fitted with a certain ticket machine. They have certain regulations put on in relation to those buses in terms of the way they're, 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 they're fit out, whether that's for um, the wheelchair or accessibility access, there's things there which would still be useful certainly on that feed, but mostly it's to do with the ticketing and the type of vehicle that they are because there could be a different class of vehicles. arise with yourselves. For the school bus? Right. No, not in the school bus, but in those issues there. And sometimes if we, 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 we have utilised some school buses for particular special events and things like Pope's that, that we business, do, right? Just make it where we've had to deploy them, but we can't deploy them for regular PSO work because the PSO work under the contract specifies a vehicle must be a certain age with a certain ticket type and ticket machine, etc. Be able to recognise the Right, for okay. Instance. The simple position as I see, we have the state to you has invested in 400 buses that can only be used for 33 weeks of the year by and large. That makes no sense to any business. The department, to you, to the taxpayer. Like, you know, you, you get the simple point. You, you couldn't afford to keep your other buses locked up for um, 20, 20 weeks of the year and not use them. You know, it, make, it makes, no, make, makes no sense. Yes. So, out of, and just tell me, is it, 80, what percent is done by the private contractors, is it? 90%. How much? 90%. 90%. So, so, routes, okay. So when do you see your buses? As years fade away, no longer fade, we're too old to put on the road. When do you see your buses being do you see a situation where you need to It's a decision, I guess, again, in relation to the department probably has to make because it was, it was, it was uh, in, in a kind of a policy decision that we'd have maybe 10% that we would call direct provision. We would do that. But can you not just buy a regular bus that's we, not a school bus we, we, and we, use it on the school bus route for 30 weeks of the year? They and have to agree with us, whatever funding. it is. Yeah, but do you not see the simple point? I can't understand why there's taxpayers' resources locked up in a garage for 20 well, something years. I suppose the, every the, year. It doesn't make sense. The, there's, a, there's a couple of issues here. One is we, no school bus owned by Bus Aaron is more than 20 years old, and that, that's a policy. So if we use them more, we might have to bring that 
that that age down. Yeah. So that, but and would that not be a good thing in, on another way in safety? Well, it, it, it might, but then we'd have to buy the, buy the buses more often because they're no longer cascading in. So there's a, there's, a, there's a policy discussion that we're having with Bus Air okay, around Okay, can, can around I ask these. then, I, I didn't ask this question before, the, 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 the 400 buses you have, you know how many passengers you carry each year, what's the cost of what you do versus the cost of what the contractors do, which is the cheapest? Like what, the CNAG says it's an average of 1,800 per head in 2015. Yeah. What, what's the figure for the most recent year? Uh, the average, would you think? It's, 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 probably, it's probably in the realms of 15 to a maximum 20% differential, depending on how you calculate the costs and okay. what you're benchmarking that price to. So as you say here, depending on when we're making the comparison, you should be actually comparing it with similar type maintenance, similar kilometres, etc. So yeah. one of the areas that we have in the direct provision is that it's always been in the CNAG, I guess would have noted this as yeah. well, it's at a, a slight premium in relation to what we pay relative to the market, but that's because of, uh, to a large extent, it's the cost of where we've required, where we've, you know, we, we're using our own staff, we're using our own vehicles, we're using our own facilities. So they, all they, what you provide internally is up to 20% dearer than the private, the average private. Which are I, I, I chair. We did a bit of we did work on this in the VFM and we have a contested comparison between private and, and, and public. A contested comparison what of costs. In other words, Bus Aaron maybe weren't fully happy with our with how we did it, but we who, did it. Who wasn't? Bus Aaron, I think at the time weren't fully right. happy with our was that? but in two thousand and ten. Well, and I referred to uh, work we're doing with the Commission at the moment and Bus Aaron are, are what coming the European Commission. Oh, I referred to that earlier on. And that Bus Aaron are coming up with a methodology t to undertake a, a comparison. Now, I'm not that, that the comparisons that the Chief Executive has referred to are, are entirely valid, but it's, it's really how do you take account of all these other Bus Aaron costs fully in working out the comparison of costs? But I presume your objective is, from the department point of view, to maintain the contract with Bus Aaron and the them subcontract rather than. So the whole thing up in the air. No, that's, that's, that goes that's, without saying. That, that's, You're working to that. That's the current policy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. And so there's no point in yeah. beating around the bush on that. Yeah. That's yeah. why I yeah. think most people would expect they don't want an English company or a Portuguese company getting the contract for school buses in Connemara, right, as being said. Well, as we said, it's, it's transport organisation is a key part of it, Chair. Right, yeah. okay. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so on average, approximately is 20, but you're saying it's contested at 20%. Now, are the regional differences between the private contractors are, on average, to get a route in Meath versus a route in, in, in Kerry? You know, a comparable route. I'm talking, don't tell me everywhere is different. Comparable routes. Yes. Are there, yes. do you find variations? <coughs> Well, I, I suppose the key point there, Chairman, is that you know the routes are, are put out to public procurement. So really, it's the market conditions that will determine what the the individual prices are oh, by county. That, but I'm asking the outcome of the process. You must know, on average, similar routes in different parts of the country. Yes. Do they yeah. come in? Yes, yes there are Well, start countries. telling yeah. us about that's what we're here at PSE to hear. Yeah. So you can't, you know. So if there's a lack of competition in a particular region, and there's strong competition we, we in another region, we see it in particular around taxi provision. Pardon? We see it in no, particular just around, around, around taxi. I'll come to the other thing. Yeah. So, so the, where are the regional differences? Have you, have you information on this? Because this, this is the PAC we're trying to find out, are we getting value for money? And if we find, like, there's lots of activities in Irish life that we've seen before. The cost of a surfacing a kilometre of a road in one county versus another county, and it's all subject to tender. But there are crazy variations. And I'm just wondering, are you experiencing the same? And does it, are there parts of the country where there's not a lot of competition in the suits? operators not to have too much competition. I know others can come in, but wh where are you finding the most expensive and the least, the most efficient? I think it's demand related as well. Pardon? So we, we know in the past year it has been difficult sometimes, you know, when you go to certain parts of the country to procure the vehicle you know, and to provide the contractors as well. So, and this is part of the reason you, 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 you have the discussion around whether you need to directly provide or not. So when, even though you might go to tender and you post a tender and you invite participants, to, if, if, if you don't get the particular response you need, then you're having to figure out how you still meet the needs of the scheme. 
So were there many cases then, say, for this school year, when you were doing this during this summer, that you weren't able to get uh, an acceptable contractor to fill a route? That you had to put in your own bus? How often did that happen? Were there many cases out of the thousands of routes? There's, there's a combination of issues that would happen, Chairman, I suppose. Uh, you know, if it is possible for us to put in our own bus, we would do it, but we would have situations then where if we didn't get... Um, if we didn't get uh, additional tenders, we may have to put a, a route out through direct award, and as I said, that would be all what done. What do you mean direct award? Reward? It, it may go to uh, the existing contractor who was um, operating it if it went out to procurement and there was no other um, compliant tender. So it would operate under a derogation on that basis. So there would be situations like that. I don't have the breakdown of, of the exact details of the amount of routes that we uh, Tendered where there may have not been a compliant tender, but we, we certainly can can arrange to yeah, submit that information the reason, through the department. The reason I say that because you mentioned it, that's why you need a public resource to fill the gap. And I'm asking you the size of the gap, and you're saying you don't have information yeah. on the gap. Yes. Well, do you follow? My yes, I do. And so we'd have to give you the, the, the precise numbers in particular regions. And we did have instances this year in Cork and, and parts of the GDA where it was difficult Greater to Dublin demand. Area. The scale of it was there for us to deliver. So, but we would meet that each year, and it just depends on whether that's an issue that's. But there must be trends that you know. Like historically, you probably know where there's strong competition, and historically, you know where you're lucky to get a contractor at all. And does that contractor? Effectively, name his price then. No, they don't. I know they don't yeah. name it, but like they know that there's you no know, one we, else. We would they always go. We would yeah. always go through, um, as I said, a best and final offer as part of our procurement a process, which? Uh, uh, what we call a BAFO uh, process, which is the best and final offer. So, where a price would be perceived to be high, we would always go back to the contractor to discuss the details of those and look for a, a further pricing schedule from them. So. As I said, this is all part of the compliance with the procurement guidelines, and, and this is what would happen every year in relation to 20% to of routes that are tendered. Yeah, 20%. Okay. Um, you just, what, I, what I would say is yeah. we're trying to... It's you understand it's, where it's my EU, questions are. It is. It's EU procurement, though, and it should be fair and equitable. And yeah. I, we wouldn't like to prejudice any particular region with any commercial sensitivity because you're still okay. trying to get the best price out of that market at that time. Okay. So, you know... Right. So, commercially sensitive, you might want to release it, right? Absolutely. Fine. We'll, Absolutely. Uh, we'll, we'll go that far with you now. But can you tell me there's regions of the country to provide similar type services, right? versus other regions, that there would be a variation of 20-30%. Now, I'm not asking you to name the regions, but yeah. does that happen? Must happen. Or there's strong competition in some places. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Like, it, it is very much determined by the local market conditions. No, I you know, no, no so, you're missing my... And, like and that is the situation, I suppose, in relation no, to I'm any not, tender I'm not situation. asking about how you get at your price and how you yeah. get at we know it's based on mm. I move beyond that, having got your price, yeah. having got your price through going through the proper procedure, yeah. do you find that the regions in the country are consistently coming in at a higher mm. price for a similar route than other regions in the country? And I'm not going to ask you to name them because you say you might be mm. given a competitive advantage or disadvantage mm. as the case may be to either side. But what are the, the variations in the the cost per mile per student that you, you have. Yeah. I presume you have that. Yeah, like we, we, do, we do have the we average have cost by yeah. vehicle type by county. Um, and, and it does it does vary, but as I said, you know, I'm not going to mention... It take me a long time to get yeah. to even say that. Uh, 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 now, what we have said is that it does vary, and it is subject to so the prevailing we, market conditions. Right. Well, we know why. I just yeah. want to know the outcome, not why. I, yeah. I know the why. Yeah. But I'm just I, trying to get the figure. I, I, but can you send us information without identifying the, re the variations? Like what, the, what, I've no sense, I'm asking here today, and I've got no sense of where market conditions dictate different prices in different regions. Does it result in, uh, from your average norm, is there a 10 per Some places must be a bit below the average price. Some regions <laughs> must be above the average price. If you don't know that, you shouldn't be here. You yeah. do know it, right? Yeah. You do know it. I'm just trying to extract the information from you without breach of any commercial sensitivity to give us an indication yeah. of um, the value for money. That's all. Yeah. Well, I, I think if, if 
really go goes back to things like capacity yeah. utilization, yeah. the design of routes, the mix of the fleet yeah. and so on. If you don't have the information on a, lo a local basis, on a route by route basis, um, then we can't be assured that uh, value for money is being hey, delivered. You, you, so that's why we, the... We're looking at a report here and I just predict, take one county. If the price, the average price per student for mile travel for the average, the number of students is X and is it minus X percent in another county and plus yeah. X percent in another county. I just want to know the variations and I'm not asking you to disclose yeah. contractors or even counties because that might... Well, that's fair enough. You know, I, I do, that's fair yeah. enough. I mean, you would expect variability in any market, and but we're simply, we're yeah. hesitant because we don't want to prejudice it. And, that's and, what I, and I'm, I'm making it clear, don't so give no us the region, but just give us the range of variation. Yeah. And it could be all in the one county for all I know, you know, but I'm not asking you to breach any commercial sensitivity. But we can't have a notion of whether there's value for money if we can't even get comparative yeah. percentages or comparative yeah. figures, you know. Yeah. Um, and it should be said that it's not all about pure cost, even though that is a very significant... Right. It's the quality and the compliance and the safety and the standards. They're all the things that we put yeah, into the decision. but surely that's minimum everywhere, a certain amount. Well, we, you yeah. know, we, we do award contracts every year and certain things are for non-compliance and we can't award it. So we, we have very strict criteria in relation to the compliance to win a tender, and it's not based solely on price. Yeah, and I accept that. Yeah, okay, and, and know, sorry. We know the national average per pupil is. Yeah, we're told this is 1800, 1800 last year, and you're saying. So I'm just trying to get the very. And the other thing, you might find this a, a weird question, but I'm thinking of the youngsters on the buses. What's the longest trip in terms of time in mile or kilometres a student spends on a bus in a single trip? Yeah. What's the longest route? I, I have to say, I, I don't know off the top of my head, but I, I'd be but happy to... But there must to. be some, you, you know, there, 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 some routes are short. If there was two of them back to back, how early does the child have to well, be I, at I'm the just, bus stop? We're, we're all showing our age, but Deputy um, Aylward mentioned when he, when he was on the school bus. When I was on the school bus, I had to be dropped a quarter past eight because the same bus had to do another run. We have guidelines, to bring in the, we have guidelines in that regard, travelling and waiting time maximum of an hour and a half. We have, yeah. An yeah. Hour and so half. can you send us the yeah. maximum times yeah. and the maximum distance individually? Because you have to have guidelines. Because the interest is safety. Yeah. You can't have a child in the bus for an hour and a quarter in the morning and an hour and a quarter in the evening. Maybe it does happen. I right. don't know. But yeah. If it's a long distance. Pardon? If they're travelling a long distance. The safety yeah. and students and, yeah. and, 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 and all that is just the, the, the longest thing. And then the last thing then is the, what, you have the figure of the average cost per pupil was around 1800 in the year. What's the average cost per pupil for children with um, the special education needs? And we know it has to be a multiple of that because there's escorts, there's drivers, there are specific routes that maybe from door to school, different things. What would be the average? Between seven and 9,000. Yeah, because I, I see that. Depend, on, on, on the briefing on the information you gave us here on page 12 of your briefing note, you have STG. What's that? What does STG mean? Special. Special Transport Grant. Grant. And then yeah, last year in 2017, that added to two point two. Um, 2.7 million, the escorts cost 25 million, and the uh, SEN is that the special education needs contracted was 66 million. So it's, it was over 90 million for the, for the 12,000, which is well over 7,000. So it's a. And all, all those um, children with special needs need to get their schools. Where do you draw the line between offering the grant to the parent or something to provide their own transport and providing this? Because if on average it costs them. 8,000 a year to operate this system, that's the average. At what point to cut off the decide? And what is the grant you give? I know it's based on distance again. It's, it's What's the minimum and maximum grant? Um, I'm not sure what the minimum and maximum, but, but it can get you get over it can, of course, yeah. Um, we have a process for how we allocate um, on a case-by-case -case basis at special needs. So the application will come to us, um, signed off by um, the NCSE, the National Council for Special Education. Um, we'll then contact Bus Aaron to see is there a route currently available. There could be a special needs school transport vehicle going by the house, in which case we'll put, just put the child on it. Um, possibly at no additional cost or a small additional cost. If we do the calculation that the grant 
would be cheaper than amending a route, then we'll offer the parents the grant. But often parents can't take the grant because yeah. both are working and yeah. stuff like that. So it's not all about economics. It comes down to the case-by-case case case child. But you just said you do offer the grant. There must be a point at which what will tell us the minimum and maximum grant here. I thought you know somebody know that straight up, you know, because it's a scheme. It's in or around 3,000. I, I don't know the exact, but My the grant is, is in or around 3,000. When I looked at these figures, up at 8,000, I was surprised how the individual grant is not, it's only half of this. And it yeah. has led to the situation where there are long distance, some parents and the cost feel is very Apologies, to, yeah. And, and if if it's in the region of three thousand, but the department is paying eight thousand for somebody to go on, with a contractor on a bus, yeah. I'm just saying maybe I can understand why some parents are reluctant to take it up if it's in the region of three thousand. But I've had parents who have it. Yeah. They said it wouldn't keep the car on the road, not the mine pay the petrol. Uh, the current rate of grant is thirty nine um, cent per kilometre for the first six thousand four hundred and thirty seven oh, kilometres. So it's the the <laughs> okay, you'll, you'll send me a figure later. So we'll send you a figure, but you're right, the, the grant does work out cheaper in certainly when you consider putting on a single vehicle or something like the grant would be a lot lower. Yeah, the cost and of do many on parents a get off for that and don't take it up? More and more we're seeing parents not taking the grant because both parents are working and things like that. And it's, um, not, very, it's not a high figure relative to the cost involved of yeah. you know, co coming, dropping a child to school, coming home and then going back a few hours later and well, coming I back again, there's four jobs. I think there's such a variance because a lot of parents like dropping their, kid, their child to school as well, so it really is... Um, it's hard, it's hard to use generalisations for the special needs no, scheme. Because, but yeah, we can certainly send to those figures. Yeah, yeah. So we are uh, reviewing with the NCSE uh, special education because you've highlighted some of the challenges. But we obviously have to be very sensitive here as well. But some of the challenges in terms of that this this cost is now the cost is, is nearly 50% of the overall cost on the scheme. You know. But there, again. The cost for special ne education needs is nearly. I, I, I think 50%. it's nearly 90 million based yeah, on the figure. That's right, I just 90 it. million of 190. So it's, it's nearly 50%. It's 50% covering what percent of the students? 10%. Yeah, and we all understand yeah, that's we right, want yeah. to get so the yeah, children to the so school. Yeah, we all understand that. And it's, you know, with the escorts and everything. Yeah. Of, I mean, our overall school. spend on special education needs in the department has gone up over the last 10 years from 0.8 billion to 1.8 billion. You know, that's a 1 billion euro increase on special education needs, more than doubled and the percentage in the last 10 increase years overall in our, yeah. in our... And, and the percentage measure. in transport is roughly yeah. the same in yeah. special education yeah. transport. Yeah. Yeah. It mirrors yeah. The, the... Yeah, no, I understand. Look, it's sorry, Deputy Aylward yeah. did want to get again. Well, first Ryan. of all, I must compliment the department on, on special needs. It's fantastic service, and I have known from my own family one person, so it's a fantastic service, and fair play to you. You're out a great service there. I just want to comment. I mean, it must have been hard on our times, because I was on a bus. We used to give an hour and a half to two and a half hours come home. So we must be harder in the 70s than they are nowadays. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't live long here about restrictions of time because uh, every evening I came home for an hour and a half to two hours to get home. Uh, in, in, we're, I'm glad to get the bus at the same time. Uh, just on, to, on, just, uh, on, um, on your comment about uh, time and uh, children, uh, just a comment said there that I know where there's a full bus on the eight, there's no tickets available, anyone is late, even an hour is late, or finished for the year because I was in Valen Sevelum where they didn't pay over weekend they forgot it and, and even an hour as case, case and were just excluded for the year because they didn't pay in time. That's where the bus is full and capacity is full. Uh, so there's no, there's, no, uh, there's no appeal system there. They were just ruled out. That was it. Gone for the whole year until the next year. Most of them learned that they all paid the year after but that was a different story in time. I just want to say uh, the, the notification to parents uh, that's a lot of frustration by parents on a Friday, they might be told, bus school is open on Monday, it happened this year, school open Monday, Monday morning, and they're told Friday evening, no bus available. I think that's very frustrating to parents and to people in general that they have to try to make it alternative arrangements, uh, as I said, working parents. Um, you know, there should be some kind of assist in place that warn them uh, a month beforehand and say, more than likely, your children will not get a uh, uh, you will not get on the bus. I think something should be done about that. As far as the appeal system is concerned, I think uh, there's no appeal system. 
as I've been through it on, on several occasions, I can give, give you several instances. There's an inspector comes out, he makes the decision, end of story. And he might come out a second time if you go to him, uh, in our cases in Waterford, we are covered from Waterford, and, uh, but there's never a change. There's no appeal system as far as I'm concerned in place. Uh, it's just whatever decision is made by a person, uh, it's, it's uh, held up, upheld, and uh, there's no comeback on it. And I can give you an example. One parent this year, um, there was a, a third of a kilometre between trying to put them to another school outside the parish and their own school in the parish they're in. A third of a kilometre, and where they were actually left off in the evening, it was par level. I did it myself in the care, and uh, I went to the inspectors, no give. No give whatsoever. A total of kilometres between the difference where they're going to school all three generations, as I said, and they're being told to go into a new parish, uh, a total of kilometres, and where they're actually being dropped off was a level uh, for between both schools. No one had listened. No one had listened, just ruled out. The bus is full, ruled out in the story. And uh, the other thing again is um, there was a health system, a health, uh, health and safety system on a, on a route that was going on for years. I've, um, the girls were even asked, my parents said that it was a dangerous uh, juncture where the bus was turning. Uh, we appealed it on several occasions. Uh, the inspector came out two or three times and said, no, that's where they're turning. And I thought that was very crude, uh, that they didn't take into consideration the safety aspect of it uh, when they were turning. And people trying to drop them off on a bad bend on the road and they're off their children are waiting for them. No place to park, no anything. And a bus turned on a turn and um, got no, no hop on that one. But uh, again, I don't think the field system is working. I think there should be a better field system in there for parents and for the like of us, uh, politicians. Now, I just want to ask this one. I have called the Minister Halligan to amend the rule which states routes can be extended or altered. Additional vehicles will not be introduced or will larger vehicles or extra trips using existing vehicles to be provided for catering for children travel on a concessionary basis to ensure that the children who apply for a concessionary ticket are accommodated. I asked that to the Minister, uh, uh, would he change that rule? And I'm going to ask you both at the department and Bus Aaron, in your opinion, from an operational point of view on the ground, would Bus Aaron be open to amending this rule and would there be a different addition cost associated with amending this rule? I'm just asking you that. I've asked the Minister, I've asked you and you're sitting here in front of me. Um, this is a question. Policy, I know it's a question it's, too. A, it's a policy political question and it's not for Boss Aaron. I didn't un fully understand, but I, I think you, what you said was could we put a bigger bus on? And I think the answer to that is of course a rule can be changed, but it has costs associated with it. In that instance, somebody would already have tendered and received a tender to provide a smaller bus. But of, of course rules can be changed, but all rules like this have costs associated with them. I prefer not to because it's, it is a policy decision. It's a policy is exclusively policy decision. a matter for the yeah. department. I'm just asking your opinion, would you think from an operation cost point of view? Yeah. Our, our, our issue is we, you know, we, we will seek to service any and all demand if funding is made available. Yeah, I, I understand this. The, the, the whole thing here is to, it's up to us ourselves here in Dal Aaron to change the rules that have been changed, to get the change back. And I, that's why I'm asking you questions that I probably would have asked the Minister and I've asked the Government. And I've even asked the, our own party to make it part of the Conference of Supply uh, to have it included. These, few, these small numbers are being excluded. And I know it's unfair to be asking you something that you're, re, you're re implementing what we are, the laws we're making. And I understand that. I've been told that every year. And, but unfortunately, I'm, when I have the opportunity, I'm asking you as well to see what you stunt my heart. That's basically what I'm going to do. That's it, Chairman. If you mind, did you? Are you completed? Uh, I just wanted to ask uh, a couple of questions in relation to claims. Um, that's a direct cost that's covered by the department, so if there's a claim against, a, uh, I presume if it's against, uh, we say, a bus airing driver or a bus, and there's a compensation claim made, the, co the cost is covered by the department, that's correct, yes? We have provisions for claims in our accounts, which would be charged in the direct costs. Okay. Is there a cap on that, or, or how is it work? Or is like you say, this year, if there was 10 million in claims, um, and it's just a figure off out of the sky, is that all recoupable by the department? Or is there a cap in place that you can only recoup a percentage of the costs? Or how does it work? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's managed on our behalf by um, CIE. So if you want to get specific, we'll have to come back to you with exactly the details. Okay. Just, there are thresholds within the. Within the there are thresholds. 
Okay. Does the department have any information in relation to this? Um, well, the within the trust program concerns, the aims were 153,000 uh, in, in 16, 370 in 17, and That's the emerging position is 402,000 in, in 18. 400, and that's contained within the transport management charge. Yeah. Okay. The, yeah. There's all. Sorry. There's the also. Charge, the charge. charge of, if you like, the management of the claims, as opposed okay. to the. Claims yeah. Claims. No, I'm talking about the, like the full cost of the claims. Sorry. There's, sorry David, there's an insurance and claims direct cost in the direct cost scheme, uh, which was, uh, for example, in 17, 789,000, and has been between 700. Thousand and nine hundred thousand from 2013 onwards. Okay, and that's fully recouped by the department. The department paid a full cost, including legal fees, engineers, doc, whatever is needed. That's correct, yeah. So it's managed by CIE. Say CIE Central. So. Do they fight the case then, or do they hire their own uh, solicitors and barristers to fight the case, or does the state claims agency have any role in it? Or? So, see, I manage our claims across all our um, transport facilities, and obviously it just depends on the different cases. Some cases will go through the PAB, some cases will not. It just okay. depends. So it's different, and different, depends on the nature of the claim. How many of those claims would be settled out of court, or how many of them would go to court? Generally, I don't have the figure here, but I'm happy to come back with that figure, yeah, basically, because I think it was asked earlier that we should come back, so we could come back with the two answers together. The, the reason I ask is because, and like, sure I'm not suggesting this is the case, but I mean, if you're not picking up the tab for those claims, then I think there's a question there around, you know, like if, if, if I'm not picking up the tab for a case made against me, you know, I may not fight it as vigorously. As somebody who is picking up the tab, which is the department, and it's my understanding the department have no role in those claims, even though they will end up picking up the tab at the end of the day. That's a correct analysis of, of that. Well, it's, a, it's a valid point. We'll come back with all of the details. I okay. think it's fair to say that with CIE, there's a lot of stewardship that happens around claims. There are monthly meetings that go through all various natures of claims. So it's very rigorous and it's been done for, I suspect, 20 plus years by and CIE. Yeah. In terms of uh, Mr. McCarthy, the CNA, do you, do you look at that in terms of are we getting value for money in terms of is within no, your remit that, or is it just that would be too detailed and too detailed. in any event we don't look at the accounts of uh, CIE or Bus Erin. But we would look at the accounts from the department so we would just get the headline figure or do we even get the headline figure but from What the you're basically seeing is the cost of the service um, and uh, I think it's, it's certainly a, a valid point about the department uh, obviously do need to interrogate those figures, you know, what makes up the, uh, the, the direct costs. Yeah. Um, and I also, if we can get the information, and I don't know if we can, but if we can, just a breakdown of the type of claims, um, how many are made in relation to accidents that may occur on the bus or uh, may involve third parties, I think it would just be interesting. And I, I, I do think. It's something that the department should look at because if you're picking up the tab for a claim that you have no role in, you don't know how vigorously that claim has been uh, uh, contested or not. Um, and maybe that's some sort of information you should be getting because uh, I think it would, uh, it might just be interesting information to have. At the moment, in the areas where we want to get further information on, but Obviously, given that Buzz Aaron is part of CIE and CIE have a duty to, to follow up, but yeah. so it's not that we're quest, it's not that we think that there's anything inappropriate going on, but at the no, same no, time, no. it's entirely appropriate that we would look at this okay. in, in more detail. We're not passive on it. We have monthly meetings that would sit, look at the risk, look at the register. We meet the CIE people. The claims are presented to us. We interrogate them. There's a management committee that would review every case that comes in decide again if the appropriateness of whether we, we defend and fight that case or whether it's a case again that you believe might be settled or something. So there's, there's a huge amount of rigour that goes into that both on the CIE side with their own investigations team and secondary investigation teams to make sure that there isn't nothing, there's nothing untoward 
that we're no, doing. No, and I appreciate I'm not suggesting that you would take a passive approach to it, but still, if you're not picking up the tab, then subconsciously, you know, these things could happen, and I just think it would be a good exercise to look at in terms of even if you could compare it against other cases that would be taken against the company where you are paying the tab yourself, um, it might be just an interesting analysis. The final one is just uh, to come back to something you said earlier in terms of the number of vehicles had dropped from about 600 and odd to 400 and odd. That's only uh, CIE vehicles, I presume. The, vehicles we use. the bus air vehicles. Okay. In terms of the private uh, contractors, then that has increased, I would imagine, because the total number of vehicles is increasing. Yeah. Okay. Um, and is there a reason for that? Is it just you don't have you don't have the vehicles, or is it down to the size or the type of vehicles that are needed? Is it the increase in the taxi service so that that is needed? It's partly a decision, I guess, related to the department where, where we provide a direct provision. There was a question of whether you replace it in each instance, and uh, for a number of years here, there's been uh, uh, a policy of contracting out where that service was, was diminished and where it was fading out. So typically we operated with um, part-time school bus drivers that are directly employed by ourselves. Yeah. And uh, as, they, as you have a, a natural attrition rate on retirement, there would have been a decision every time there to decide whether you replace that or whether you contract out that service. So for, for the last couple of years, we've ended up going the other, the other way as opposed to um, directly hiring. Okay, so if we had a if we had a a bus errand driver on the school routes, um, as they retire, we're not really replacing them. We're looking at subcontracting them out to the private sector. Well, we're in discussions. Behind every driver, there's usually a vehicle, and and that's the issue at the moment here. So as we've explained, there has been a long-term issue where. The, the traditional pr practice of cascading from road passenger vehicles into schools is, no, is probably not a solution that can be followed anymore, so it creates an issue, and at some point here, where we're, we're arriving at that point now, where there's a funding decision required in relation to whether you continue to replace vehicles at direct provision, either at current levels or at some level where you believe will satisfy the market going forward, and that's a dialogue now that we're entering into with the department. And in uh, terms of the pensions for those drivers, do we have a figure in relation to what is the annual output or what the annual cost of those pensions? Um, pensions. The reason I ask is because we know from the surplus that there was three million for future pensions for school bus drivers set aside um, against the surplus. Like, is that three million? What does it cover? Does it, does it cover the next five years, ten years? So we've How many set, drivers we, we does it cover? We set aside in our balance sheet, basically, for future um, express payments in relation to drivers as and when they retire. Okay. And that's all recouped? So all uh, the department pick up that tab then as well? Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Now well, that's about it. <coughs> Thank you, Deputy. And I think at this stage, <clears throat> I can safely say we've concluded our discussion. And <clears throat> I want to thank all the witnesses from the Department of Education and Skills from Bus here and Good. And we thank you for being here with the Department, also the Department of Transport, Tourism and Trade, and for the material provided to us. And to be a note, we expect to receive this. We had some requests for information, which either the department or yourselves will send on directly to the Commission Secretariat in writing. And I want to thank the CNAG and his staff. And finally, I want to wish all the witnesses and members here a happy Christmas and all the best for the new year. And we're adjourned until sometime in January. So the meeting is adjourned, Sina Dia. The meeting is now adjourned. Thank you.